you. Thank you. About eight or nine years ago, there was a new cafeteria that opened here in Dallas. And I like to eat in cafeterias because I can choose exactly what I want and I can see what I'm about to eat. So I was excited about this one because it was a new chain of cafeterias and give us a new uh, source of eating. Well, the redhead and I rode past it. Now, my wife, incidentally, I refer to her as the redhead. She's a decided redhead, meaning simply that one day she just decided uh, she is going to be a redhead. And when I talk about her, uh, I call her the redhead. When I'm talking to her, it's sugar baby. And her name is Jean. Well, the redhead and I were riding down, and every time we would pass the cafeteria, the line was sticking out the door. Finally, the beautiful day came, no line out the door, we go walking in. When we walked in, we could understand why the line was not out the door, because they had snaked it all over the place. We were already parked, so we decided to stay. She and I visited as we walked down the line, had about 30 people in it. We got to the end of that line and turned around, and there was another line of about 30 people. So we were walking and talking as we walked down, turned around, there's another line of about 30 people. But this time I could see what was going to be available. I could see between the people being served. And I made mental notes as I walked down the line, said, I believe I'll have me some of that. Yeah, and that looks good. Boy, I want me some of that. Boy, and I like the looks of that. I'll take me some of that. Now, it's important that you make these decisions because I don't care how prodigious your appetite is. You cannot eat some of everything on a big cafeteria line. So I had to make those choices. Finally, I got my tray and my silver, and I came down the line, and my choice has already been made, so I wasted no time. I said, I'll take me some of that, and give me some of that, and I want some of that, and I'll have some of that. Got to the end of the line, I reached in my uh, pocket and pulled out my money. The lady held up her hand, and she said, no, you don't pay for it until you get ready to go. I said, you mean to tell me you're going to let me eat all of this food and not have to pay for it until I get ready to go? She said, yeah, that's just the way we do it. Well, I can't tell you the number of times I've thought about that because, you see, in one sense of the word, that is exactly like life, the cafeteria line is. In life, we have an incredible assortment of choices of the places we can live, the things we can do, the foods we can eat, the occupations we can follow. An incredible number of choices. That's the way the cafeteria line is. Life is just like that. But on the other end of the scale, life is 180 degrees apart from the cafeteria line. In the cafeteria, you eat and then you pay. But in the game of life, you pay and then you eat. You go to school, you study your lessons, you pass the grade. They move you up to the next grade until you graduate from high school. Then if you go to college, then you study your lessons again. You get your degree. Then if you go on to graduate school. And finally, after all of that is over, you get into your profession and you work a week, a month, or whatever. And then and only then, after you've done all of those things, qualified and then done the work, do you receive the pay. The farmer plows the ground, he plants the seed, he waters it, he fertilizes it, he nurses it along, he kills the insects, and finally the day comes when he can go to the fields and bring it in and take it to the marketplace, and then he cashes it in. That's the way it is. You first pay, and then you receive the benefits. As we look at this segment of personal growth, we're going to be talking about the fact that we've all got to have goals in life. Most of us, you see, are very much like this old boy down home. His wife sent him downtown to buy ham. He came home and she said, honey, you didn't cut the end of it off. He said, you didn't tell me to. She said, well, I thought you knew we always cut the end of the ham off. And he said, why? She said, well, mother always cuts the end of the ham off. He said, well, mama's back in the kitchen. Let's go back there and ask her. So they went to the kitchen and said, mama, how come you cut the end of the ham off? She said, I always cut the end of the ham off because my mama cuts the end of the ham off. So the old boy said, well, let's solve this three-generation mystery right now. They got on the phone long distance. They called Grandma, and they said, Grandma, how come you cut the end of the ham off? She said, I cut the end of the ham off because my roaster is too small. <laughs> <laughs> now, Grandma had a reason for cutting the end of the ham off. 
But the question is, do you have a reason? The reality is that 97% of the people in our society do not have clearly defined, written down goals for their lives. Now, there are four basic reasons they don't have goals. And the first reason, actually, is because of fear, spelled, of course, F-E-A-R. And this forms an acrostic for false evidence appearing real. So many millions of people have been conditioned to believe that there is no use in setting goals because over a period of time, nothing good is going to happen to them anyhow. They've been told a lot of times that you cannot do things, don't expect it. The input basically has been negative. Chad Helmstetter, in his book, What to Say When You Talk to Yourself, points out that the average 18-year-old has been told 148,000 times, no, or you can't do it. 77% of our self-talk is negative. Dr. J. Allen Peterson, in his book, The Myth of the Green and Grass, points out that one computer study revealed that over 90% of the daily input in our minds is of a negative nature. And so a lot of people, therefore, simply do not set those goals. They've accumulated some false evidence, but it appears real, and they act accordingly. Because if it appears real as a practical matter, it has the same impact as if it were real. For example, I could go into any city, just about anywhere in the world, with nothing but my handkerchief that I have in my hand, and I could rob a bank with my handkerchief in my finger. All I'd have to do is put the handkerchief across my face, put my finger in my coat pocket, aim at the teller, and say, give me your money. The evidence would be false. It would appear real. And that individual would handle it as if there were a real gun in there. Now, I'd walk out with the money. I might get shot on the way out, but at least that teller would surrender that money. You might have seen this. A young Cuban hijacked a plane to Cuba using nothing but a bar of soap. He put the bar of soap in a box. He said to the captain of the aircraft, this is a bomb. Let's go to Cuba. They went to Cuba. The evidence was false. It appeared real. The thing about life, the thing about nature is this. Oliver Wendell Holmes years ago said, the great tragedy in America today is not the waste of our natural resources, though that is a great tragedy. He said the real tragedy is the waste of our human resources. And the average individual will go to their grave with their music still in them. You see, man and nature are 180 degrees apart. We use up nature's natural resources by using them up. We use up man's natural resources by not using them at all. Fear keeps a lot of people from setting goals. The second thing that keeps a lot of people from setting goals is because they have such a poor self-image. They cannot imagine in their wildest imagination them becoming college graduates, getting the superb job, living in the nice home, winning the ideal mate. They cannot imagine themselves being financially successful or secure. Their image simply will not let them get there. Now understand again that we perform in accordance with the image or the picture we have planted in our own mind. Positive thinking will not work for the individual who is negative on himself. You've got to have that positive image, that good self-image of yourself. One of the most amazing stories, which I believe really epitomizes what I want to say about this, is the story of Tom Hartman. On January the 28th, 1979, Tom Hartman attended a seminar up in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. It was an all-day seminar. Later, I got a letter from him. Since then, he and I have become friends. We've corresponded a number of times, visited a number of times. And the gist of the story is this. He attended that seminar that day because his brother had an extra ticket. That was Tom's day off. There were about 15 or 1,600 other people there. Tom sat in the very center of the audience. In his first letter to me, he said, you know, Zig, as I sat there, I hadn't been there three minutes before I realized I was in the wrong place. You were in front of this audience saying some wild things, like you can go where you want to go, you can do what you want to do, you can be like you want to be. 
And I thought to myself, oh, brother, is that a bunch of baloney? I'd heard guys like you before. And to be honest, he said, it made me a little uncomfortable. And I looked around for a way for me to easily get out of there in case it got any worse, which is exactly what it did. It wasn't three more minutes when you actually had the gall to look at that audience to all of us and say, God loves you and he wants the best for you. And I knew that was a bunch of baloney and I really looked around for a way to get out. But there I was stuck right in the middle. 15 or 1,600 people, and there was no way I could get up without creating a disturbance. So he said, I looked at my watch, and I just decided I would get out of there at the first break, and that would be the end of that. A few minutes later, you even made some reference to the fact that we were going to be dead longer than we were going to be alive, and therefore we needed to be setting those really long-range goals. Was it long when you had the audacity to say to us that man was designed for accomplishment? He's engineered for success. He's endowed with the seeds of greatness. Now, when you said that, Zig, you said, I looked down and I thought to myself, well, is it at least partially right? Because I was looking at a 63 and one half inch waistline and 407 pounds of bulk. He said, I was coming off a devastating divorce. I had a job only because my employer was my friend, not because I was actually earning the money. Hadn't been to church in many years. I was so broke that every Friday night I was writing a hot check so I could get something to eat and I would pick it up on Monday morning. This was, I said, was about 10 years ago. And he said, there you were seeing all of those things. And I don't really know, Zig, what it was that you said. But somehow or other, something rang a bell in my mind. And I don't know whether it was because of the repetition or because somebody behind me said, that's right, or reinforced you in some way. But I reached over and I got my pen and I started to take notes on my yellow pad. I said, Zig, I took notes all day long. When I got through for the first time in my adult lifetime, I saw just a glimmer of hope. I so desperately wanted to get your set of tapes on motivation, but I did not have a dime to my name. And my brother, bless his heart, he loaned me the money. I went home that day and I listened to those tapes. That evening, seven hours. I'd listened to you live seven hours. Now I listened to you seven hours on tape. The next morning, I came in and the first thing I did was tell my boss that he no longer just had a friend on the payroll, that he now had an employee. Old Tom kind of grins, and he said, I even told him I was going to start carrying my own weight. Now, he said, Zig, you know, at 407 pounds, that represented a pretty substantial statement. He went over to Oklahoma City University that afternoon and enrolled in a couple of courses in psychology. He was already taking a couple of courses in history, and he decided to switch over so he could learn something about himself and something about his fellow man. The next day, he went down to the Nautilus Health Studio. He decided to do something about his miserable physical condition. Then on Thursday, he went down to one of the men's stores and laid aside about $700 worth of clothes with a minute down payment. When the owner of the store saw him buying size 47 coats and 39 slacks, he went to him and he said, Mr. Hartman, who are you buying the clothes for? Tom told me, he said, when I told him I was buying it for myself, he looked at me like he thought I was crazy. But I said to him, don't worry about it. I will wear these clothes out of here. Tom Hartman said, you know, Zig, somebody might resist you once or twice or a dozen times. But when you keep telling them that you are important, that you are somebody, that you do have ability, that you can do things with your life, he said, I just believe eventually that it will get through. And he kind of grins and he says, you know, isn't it amazing? A message can go around the world 24,000 miles in less than a tenth of a second. And then sometimes it takes years for it to go that last one-eighth of an inch. But he said, finally, the message got through to me. I was listening every day. And as a matter of fact, Zig, he said, I've listened to your tape so much that if you ever get a sore throat, don't you dare cancel the engagement. You just call me because he said, I can deliver it verbatim. <laughs> he said, I've even got the same accent, if you can imagine him accusing me of having an accent. Well, he said, you know, Zig, I 
I'd been on the program about six weeks. Never forget it. I was in a store getting my food. And there was a little four-year-old girl in there with her mother. And those of you who are ever four years old, or if you have four-year-olds, you know there's one thing about a four-year-old, when a thought pops in the mind, it pops out of the mouth uncensored. I mean, you get truth, pure truth, out of the mouth of a four-year-old. Well, in a voice that you could hear halfway between Dallas and Fort Worth, this little four-year-old screamed out, Mama, look at that fat man. And Tom said, I turned around to see where he was. <laughs> and he said, then it dawned on me, she was talking about me. And he said, I thought that was the funniest thing I'd ever heard in my life. He said, I laughed until I literally cried. And then he said, I shed a different kind of a tear. Because he said, for the first time in my adult lifetime, I really knew and knew that I knew that I was going to make it. He said, that was reinforced about a month later. I'd been to the movie. I was on the way back to my car. I was in no hurry. I had nowhere to go, nothing to do when I got there. And we've all done this as we amble down the street with no direction in mind, no hurry involved. He saw a display in a window. And though he was not really interested in the display, he ambled over and he started looking at it. And Tom said, you know, Zig, I don't know whether I was there for one minute or 10 minutes. But he said, all of a sudden, I became aware of the fact that I was not by myself. Some big dude was looking over my shoulder, and he said, I whirled around. And, of course, there was no one there because Tom Hartman had been looking at his own image, which he no longer recognized. Good friend of mine before his tragic death, John Kozak from Dunedin, Florida, brilliant young psychiatrist, said that at that specific moment, Tom Hartman was no longer obese. Though he still weighed over 360 pounds, he was no longer obese because he no longer saw himself as an obese person. The basic problem with crash diets, according to Dr. Kozak, is that they will take the weight off your body. That's relatively easy. But then that individual lays down at night in the dream, and they dream as an overweight person. And the body goes to work to complete the picture the mind has given it. Tom Hartman no longer saw himself as an overweight person. Now, what's the end of the story? Well, of course, the story hasn't ended yet. But Tom Hartman graduated magna cum laude with his degree in psychology. He's working on his doctorate. Tom weighs a little over 200 pounds, which is about what he should weigh. He's about six feet, three inches tall and has a very large frame. He teaches a Sunday school class every Sunday. He's in business for himself. And I give you the story in such great detail because I believe that when you analyze it, here is a man who was physically bankrupt, spiritually bankrupt. He was socially bankrupt. From a family perspective, he was bankrupt. He was bankrupt in every important area of life. And yet, because he became involved in the development of a good self-image, he got involved in setting those goals, and the results were absolutely spectacular. You got to have goals. The third reason that 97% of the people don't have goals is basically they have never really been sold. Now, that's my prime function in this particular segment is to sell you on having your goals, and that is exactly what I'm going to do. By the time this recording is over, you will, in fact, be sold on the absolute necessity of having goals. I am so confident that you're going to be sold that I'm going to tell you that before you go to bed tonight, you will have started taking the important steps to setting your own goals. I'll even go further than that. If you don't write some of your goals down this very evening, you might as well not go to bed as far as sleep is concerned because you are not going to be able to go to sleep. Let me say that again. <laughs> if you don't write them down, you're not even going to be able to go to sleep. You absolutely must have goals. Now, I want to stress, goals work for individuals, they work for families, they work for companies, and they work for nations as well. 
the basic problem that we face is this. Most people, when they're busy working on the job, they get to thinking, you know, I really ought to be spending more time with my family. And then when they're spending time with their family, they get to thinking, you know, I really ought to be out there working for my family. And when they're out there working with their family or for their family, the mind is back home. And when they're back home, their mind is back out there in the field. Then they tell everybody, well, I don't ever have time for anything. No wonder you're always traveling. You see, the truth is, most people, when they're at work, their mind is at play. When they're at play, their mind is at work. So they're neither working nor playing wherever they are that is wasting time any way you look at it. And one of the beautiful things about having goals and directions is the fact that you will be able to work when you work and play when you play. I will not suggest that you work harder. As a matter of fact, by the time we get through, you will probably end up working less. But when you're on the job, you will be on the job. You will be working infinitely more effectively when you work in this manner. And you will have that balance of life. We say it so many times in so many different ways. There's a difference between standard of living and quality of life. And we're going to be looking at quality of life because that's the significant thing. Now, please understand, everybody has goals. One of your goals, for example, if you're in your car listening to this recording, one of your goals was to listen to this recording. Everybody has goals. But we want to get a little more involved in that. We really want to get involved so that we know exactly what we're doing and why we're doing it, and we can get much better results. 1973, they did another study on those seniors who had graduated from Yale. And in the two areas which they could measure, that is their financial accomplishments and their career accomplishments, the 3% who had taken all of the seven steps had accomplished more than the 97% who had not. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence is absolutely overwhelming. You must have those goals. You cannot make it as a wandering generality. You must become a meaningful specific. A lot of people go to work tomorrow because that's what they did yesterday. And if that's the reason you're going to go tomorrow, you won't be as good as you were yesterday because now you're two days older and you're no closer to the goal, which you do not have. A lot of people complain about lack of time. It is not lack of time in 99% of the cases. It is lack of direction. Direction literally creates time and motivation creates energy. Let me see the hands of those in here who have ever had one of those days. Can I see your hand? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? All right. Uh, you get up early in the morning. You've got that a critically important appointment at 830. And so you get up two hours early. You want to make absolutely certain you get there on time. And you walk out the front door. You're all spiffed up and spanked up. I mean, you're really raring and ready to go. You got a full hour to get there. But as you walk out, you notice that you've got a flat tire. That's the best thing that happens to you all day long. I mean, that is just the beginning point of it right there. You hustle and bustle and sweat and you get the tire changed and you got to change your clothes, you clean up, and you rush down to the appointment. You get there on exactly the specified time and you see a little note on the door. Sorry, I was called out of town. Uh, have thought the matter over. Have decided I'm not interested. Don't you call me. I will call you. <laughs> you go down to the office and you're greeted with a ringing telephone as you walk in. It is your administrative assistant and she cannot make it for that day. You notice that it appears to be unusually hot and that's because the air conditioner has cut off. A couple of hours later, the plumbing breaks down and one thing after another all day long until finally, mercifully, the day ends. <laughs> And you're not whipped, you are whooped. I mean, you have had it. You wearily get your coat, you struggle out to the car, and you drive home with scarcely enough energy to walk in the front door. Your wife, of course, lovingly greets you there at the front door, and she said, Honey, I'm so glad that you didn't have to work late, because today is the day. 
Today is a day for what? Oh, honey, don't tell me you've forgotten. You know, we planned on this for the last three weeks. We planned on what? Today is the day, honey. Don't you remember today is the day we cleaned the garage? <laughs> oh, honey, not today. I couldn't put one foot in front of another, and I just don't have any. Oh, honey, it's not going to take that long. I'm going to help you. It won't take more than two, three, four, five hours. Absolute maximum. Oh, honey, I just can't not today. I just ain't up to it. I don't have any energy, and the telephone rings. Boy says there and says, hey, partner, I've got us a tea time over at the country club in 17 minutes. We've got time to get in nine if you feel like playing. If I feel like playing, man, I'll be there in 10 minutes. And everybody here agrees with exactly what I'm saying, don't you? The answer is yes, isn't it? <clears throat> okay. I want to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. We've got plenty of energy to do the things we really want to do. But as I often say, life is not easy, life is tough. But when you're tough on yourself, life is going to be infinitely easier on you. And I'm going to tell you that when you do the things you ought to do, when you ought to do them, the day will come when you can do the things you want to do, when you want to do them. A lot of people say, well, I just don't feel motivated to do something. Well, you got it backwards. You do the something, and then you will feel motivated to do it. Motivation literally follows the action. Motivation creates energy. When you talk about goals, I love the story of Jean-Henri Fabre, the great French naturalist. He conducted a series of experiments with some processionary caterpillars, so named because they follow each other in a procession. He lined them around a flower pot until they formed a never-ending circle. He put some pine needles in the center of the flower pot, that is the food of the processionary caterpillar. They started going round and round and round, 24 hours a day, 48 hours in a two day, 72 hours, and then they kept going on and on for seven full days and seven full nights. They went round and round and round until they literally dropped dead from starvation and exhaustion. With an abundance of their favorite food less than six inches away, they had starved to death because their confused activity with accomplishment. A lot of people do exactly the same thing. You don't know where you live, but I can tell you something about your town. And I can tell you about somebody who's in the same business that you are. Some of them are doing exceptionally well, and some of them are not doing good at all. And I don't care what that business is. It's not the location. It is not our abilities. But basically, it is because of our thinking and our direction that definitely is going to make the difference. There are so many people, you see, who never really get those directions in life. You've seen them in every company. They will come in and you watch them all day long. They're almost hyper. They're here and they're there and they're everywhere else. I mean, they're busy, busy, busy. But at the end of the day, you will still see a full desk and no evidence that they've accomplished anything because they really don't have direction. The most outstanding example of goal setting that I have ever heard of has to do with the Japanese. In 1950, a war-torn, devastated Japan, a nation which had lost a higher percentage of its young men to war than any nation in the last 100 years, cities had been bombed out, they have no real natural resources. They have no iron ore. They have no coal. They have no oil. But in 1950, the leaders of government and business and industry got together. And they said, let's set a goal. Let's become the number one nation in the world in the production of textiles during the 1950s. And they made it. In 1960, they set the impossible goal. And that was to become the number one nation in the world in the production of steel. Now, in order to do that, they got to build the steel mills. 
They've got to import the iron ore from thousands of miles away. They've got to import the coal and the oil from thousands of miles away. They've got to manufacture the steel. Then they've got to ship it thousands of miles to its market and undersell its competition. Impossible. But the Japanese in this case did not look at what they did not have. They looked at what they did have. A willingness to work. And they worked hard. They reached their goal. In 1970, they set another goal. They said, during this decade, let's become the number one nation in the world in the production of automobiles. They missed it by one year. It took them until 1980, when their plant became the largest and number one producer of automobiles in the world. In 1980, they set another goal. They said, during this decade, let's become number one in the production of electronics and computers. And all you've got to do is go to video land, and all you've got to do is look at the computer world today, and you can see exactly what they are doing. Because goals do work, whether it's for the individual, the family, or the company, or the nation, I'm absolutely convinced that we have a real threat, unless we have our goals more firmly in place, and that is to remain strong, so we will remain free. Goals absolutely work. I love the story of Sir Edmund Hillary. You might have heard it. Sir Edmund Hillary, you know, was the first man to scale Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the whole world. Can you imagine him climbing down off that mountain? And one a reporter comes up to him and said, Tell me, Sir Edmund, how did you climb the tallest mountain in the whole world? How did you do it? Do you think for one moment he said, Well, I, 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 I was just out walking around. <laughs> Can you imagine the chairman of the board, General Motors? Somebody comes to him and said, how'd you get to be the chairman of the board for General Motors? And he said, well, I, I just showed up for work and they started promoting me and here I am, the chairman of the board for General Motors. Can you imagine the coach of an NFL football team, Landry, for example, calling the Cowboys together one Saturday afternoon and saying, fellas, now, you know we're gonna play them Washington Redskins tomorrow. That's a pretty tough bunch. We better think of something to do. You see, that's absurd. It's ridiculous. They will spend hours and hours and hours planning a football game. And yet we don't plan the most important events in our life. Too many Americans spend more time planning the wedding than they spend planning the marriage. Too many people spend more time planning on how to get the job than they spend on how to becoming productive and successful in that job. You got to have goals. J.C. Penney expressed it this way. Give me a stunt clerk with a goal and I'll give you someone who will make history. But he said, you give me someone without a goal and I will give you a stunt clerk. You gotta have goals. That's for sure. I don't know if the name Howard Hill rings a bell with you or not. Howard Hill was a good Alabama boy and he was an archer. He entered 286 archery tournaments. He placed first 286 times. He killed a Cape Buffalo, the toughest game animal alive to bring down. He killed it with a bow and arrow. He killed a Bengal tiger with a bow and arrow. He killed a lot of game animals with a bow and arrow. As a youngster, I have seen newsreels of Howard Hill from a distance of 50 feet where he would literally split the bullseye dead center and then he would take the next arrow and split that dead center. An incredible demonstration of skill. He killed an 18-foot shark under 15 feet of water. Or was it a 15-foot shark under 18 feet of water? I know it was a great big one in his way down there. I do know that. Howard Hill was an incredible marksman. Now, I have never shot the bow and arrow professionally, but I am an instructor par excellence. That means I'm good. That means I'm real good. As a matter of fact, I am so good as an instructor that I could take anyone in this live audience this evening or anyone who will ever hear this recording. And if your eyesight is good and your health is good, 
I could spend 20 minutes with any one of you, and at the end of the 20 minutes, I would have you hitting the bullseye more consistently than Howard Hill could have hit it the best day he ever had. Provided, of course, we had first blindfolded Howard Hill. <laughs> and turn him around a couple of times so he'd have no idea which direction he was facing. And you kind of snicker to yourself, especially those I imagine who are listening to this recording, as you say to yourself, well, as I know, that's uh, true, of course, but it sure is a silly example. Why, well, how on earth could anybody possibly hit a target they couldn't even see? That's a pretty good question. Here's one even better. How can you hit a target you don't even have? Have you got your targets? Have you written them down? Have you spelled out the details of why you want to reach those goals in the first place? Have you identified the obstacles you have to overcome in order to get there? See, something stands between what you've got and what you want. If there was nothing between you and your goals, then you'd already be there. You've got to find out what those obstacles are. Have you spelled out what you need to know to reach your goals? Have you identified the people, the groups, and the organizations you need to work with in order to get there? Have you devised a specific plan of action in order to get there? And finally, have you put the date on it? Now, the fourth reason that most people don't have goals basically is because they don't know how. I'm going to give you some bad news and some good news. And as you know, you're going to get the bad news first. I mean, I'm not going to give you a choice. You get the bad news first. The bad news is this. If you really get involved in this goal-setting process, it will take you somewhere between 10 and 20 hours to really set your goals. If you really have a complex set of goals, it might take you 30 hours to set your goals. That's another reason so many people never do really set them because that is a tremendous time investment. Now that's the bad news. The two bits of good news that go with it. On the absolute authority of several years of personal experience and the experience of many, many people who've been doing this, I can assure you that once you have set those goals properly, you will have created for yourself an additional three to as many as 10 hours every week of your life for the rest of your life. Let me say it again. When you discipline yourself to do the things you ought to do, when you ought to do them, the day will come when you can do the things you want to do when you want to do them. The good news is this will give you an awful lot of time to pursue the things which you have a real interest. It will give you control of your time and your activities and your future. The rest of the good news is this. When you learn how to set one goal, you'll know how to set all goals. When you learn how to set a physical goal, you'll also know how to set a mental, a spiritual, a social, a family, a career, and a financial goal. Because there's a procedure, there's a formula for setting all of them. If you can figure out the answer to what 12 times 12 is, you can also figure out what the answer to 2,865 times 9,412 is. If you know the formula, you can come up with the answer. Now to get you started on goals, let me share a little story with you, which I believe is significant. You see... I think, as I tell this story and use this example, I think everybody ought to write a book. I don't necessarily believe you ought to get the book published or make any effort to get it published, but you ought to write a book. And I'll tell you what the title ought to be. What I think you ought to do to get the most out of life. Let me make a strong statement. If my book, See You at the Top, which has now sold 2 million copies counting foreign editions, if this book had never sold a single copy, I would still say this is the most profitable thing that I have ever done if it had never sold a single copy. Now, I'm not only talking about standard of living, but I'm also talking about quality of life when I make that statement. 
You see, this book really ought to be entitled, What I Think You Ought to Do to Get the Most Out of Life. As I was writing this book, I realized what I was doing was I was clarifying my thinking about what life was all about. For the first time, I really discovered what I believed, what I felt was important, and the research uncovered a number of things that I already believed but I'd never been able to articulate. The title of your book ought to be What I Think You Ought to Do to Get the Most Out of Life. I want to share information about this because I believe this is a classic example about what goal setting and goal reaching is all about. When I started writing this, the first words I wrote were, you can go where you want to go, you can do what you want to do, you can be like you want to be. Well, as I looked at those words, I kind of got to talking to myself, which incidentally, I hasten to add, is perfectly all right. I was on a program with Dr. Joyce Brothers, and she said, scientifically speaking, they have proved that people who talk to themselves are above average in intelligence. <laughs> so if you've been talking to yourself, just be about it. It's perfectly all right. I'd like to express a personal opinion. That's all it is, personal opinion. I believe it's all right to answer. <laughs> but if you ever catch yourself saying, huh? <laughs> you got a problem. I caught myself saying, huh, uh, because I noticed I was holding the words I'd written way out there because there was a 41-inch waistline between me and the book and well over 200 pounds of Ziegler. And the thought occurred to me that one of these days I'd be bumping into one of you slender guys or gals and I could visualize you coming up to me and saying, Ziggler, you believe all that stuff you write? And I was going to say, of course I do. Then I could visualize you saying, do you believe it all? And I was going to say, well, of course I do. Then I could imagine you poking your finger in that 41-inch waistline and saying, Ziggler, do you believe it all? Then I was going to say, well, you know, us authors, we do take a little literary license every once in a while. <laughs> Ziggler, is that your fancy way of saying you lied about it? Now, hold the phone, friend. Don't call me a liar. People don't like liars. Well, you're at least a hypocrite then, man. Don't call me a hypocrite. People sure don't like hypocrites. I know you know that a hypocrite is a person who simply is not himself on Sunday. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you know, I've, I've had a lot of people say, well, the only reason I don't go to church is nothing but a bunch of hypocrites down there. Of course, I always tell them, friend, don't let that stop you. Come on down. We got room for one more. <laughs> you know? Like I've had people say, well, I'd read the Bible, but I don't understand it. Of course, I don't think it's the part they don't understand that bothers them. Actually, the Bible is pretty clear. I bet you noticed it didn't call them the Ten Suggestions. Well, anyhow, I had to make a decision. I had to decide either to take those words out of the book or I had to do something about me. Well, my boy was eight years old, and I've always felt that a father ought to be able to spank his children until they get to be at least 12. The rate we were going, I wasn't even going to be able to catch mine, much less spank him. So I knew something had to be done. But the straw that Brody Camel's back, the redhead kept telling me to hold my stomach in, and I already was. So I knew I had to do something. Went down to see Dr. Cooper at Cooper Clinic of aerobics fame. You know, he wrote the books. They've sold over 15 million copies in a jumpteen number of foreign languages. I went down for the examination. First thing they did was took two quarts of my blood. Well, it looked like two quarts. They filled so many vials, I thought they were opening a branch of the blood bank right then and there. Then they dunked me in a tank of water three times. The purpose of that was to determine the percentage of body fat I had. When I got through, they told me I was 23 and 9 tenths percent pure lard. <laughs> then they put me on the treadmill, and on the treadmill, you know, you walk and you walk and you walk and you walk, and the longer you can walk, the better your physical condition. The worst possible condition was horrible. I decided, I just made up my mind, I'm going to stay on it until I at least get into just awful. And I made it by four seconds. <laughs> when they finished the examination, uh, Dr. Martin, the examining physician, called me in and he said, Mr. Ziegler, you'll be delighted to know that we've run all of these figures through the computer. And you, sir, are actually not overweight. I said, well, that's fantastic. However, he said, uh, according to the computer, you're exactly five and one-half inches too short. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And I said, well, Doc, that's pretty bad, isn't it? He said, no. He said, actually, you're in remarkably good shape for a 66-year-old. I said, Doc, I'm 46. He, he said, you're in awful shape. He said, as a matter of fact, if you were a building, I'd condemn you. And I said, well, Doc, what can I do? And he whipped out a sheet of paper thicker in my book to start telling me what I could do. And I tell you, he told me lots more than I wanted to know. I got home, and Redhead said, well, I suppose you're going to be out running all over the neighborhood. And I said, yes, I am. Well, they said, if I'm going to have a 46-year-old fat boy running all over the place, I got to get you looking as good as I can. So she went down to the store and bought me some fancy running shirts and shorts, and I'd already gotten the shoes the doctor had recommended. Oh, and I did something else, and it was very ugly. But I had not read Ann Landers at the time, and I'm going to use that as my excuse. You know, Ann Landers said you should not steal pages out of other folks' magazines. There was a magazine at Dr. Cooper's office. Now, it was an old magazine. <laughs> it had an advertisement in there for jockey shorts. And I don't know if you folks read the jockey short ads or not, but if you don't read them, the next time you see one, you said, at least look at the picture. You'll find out in a hurry, they don't put jockey shorts on fat boys. <laughs> At least they don't have a good year. And so I took that picture out and I pasted it on my bathroom mirror and I said, now there's my hero. That's the way I'm going to look right there. Well, the next morning, the opportunity clock sounded off bright and early. Negative people, you know, call them alarm clocks. I rolled out of bed. I put on my fancy running outfit, hit the front door, and I ran a block. <laughs> Did better the next day, though. I ran a block and a mailbox. <laughs> And the next day I ran a block in two mailboxes, and a block in three, and a block in four. One day I ran all the way around the block, came back in, woke the whole family up and said, guess what dad has done? <laughs> then one day I ran a half a mile, then a mile, then a mile and a half, then two, then three, then four, then five. The weight started coming down from 202 to 165. The waistline fell to 34. A lot of times people have said, yeah, but I'll bet you were dieting religiously all that time. That is partially true because I did quit eating in church. <laughs> tried a 30-day diet and lost a month incidentally for those who want to lose weight and i know it sounds like i'm trying to get everybody to go on a diet that is not my purpose for this crowd this evening though there are five of you who should <laughs> now there are about 65 of you who wonder who the other four are but anyhow <laughs> for those of you who want to know about weight loss, let me give you four fast little tips to lose weight. Number one, and probably the most important, stay away from cottage cheese. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but cottage cheese is the most fattening food in existence. Now, understand I have no scientific evidence of this or proof, but the evidence is so compelling, I know I'm right. Because as I've traveled all over the world, I've noticed it is internationally true that don't nothing but fat folks eat the stuff. <laughs> so stay away from cottage cheese. Number two, get a thorough examination. This is on the serious side. Get a thorough examination from your skinny doctor. Now, if he's not slender, that means he doesn't believe in the importance of taking that care of his body, and he or she are not going to be very persuasive as far as their dealing with you is concerned. Get a thorough physical from a doctor who believes in what he's doing. The third thing is this. If the doctor starts to give you a prescription, do not walk out on the doctor, run out on the doctor. <laughs> You didn't gain the weight taking pills, and you're not going to permanently lose the weight by taking the pills. Now, I'm going to make a claim which I could not prove in 10,000 years, but I honestly believe it's the truth. I believe that more people have lost more weight and kept it off as a result of listening to these recordings and reading See You at the Top than have ever lost on 99 and 9 tenths percent of all of the diet books ever written. You see, diet really and weight is not really the problem. That simply is the manifestation of the problem. 
The fourth thing is if you get a negative doctor, swap him off for a positive doctor. Now, what's a negative doctor? Basically, it's a doctor that always tells you what you can't eat. You can't have this, leave that alone, doesn't touch that. Man, stay away from this. What they're really saying is now, if you like it, you can't have it. If you don't like it, eat all you want. That basically is what they boil down to. The thing I loved about Dr. Martin was the fact that he was so positive. I've never seen a more positive doctor. He is a slender young guy, runs in the Boston Marathon, does the good things. Dr. Martin said to me, Mr. Ziegler, you're going to be delighted to know that you can eat anything you want. He said, I have prepared a list of what you are going to want. <laughs> People often say to me, Ziegler, what can't you eat? I don't know what I can't eat. Why should I clutter up my mind with a bunch of stuff can't have anyhow? I can tell you that I can eat lots of chicken. I can eat lots of fish. I can eat fruits and vegetables and salads. I can eat, on occasion, good lean roast beef. I can eat just about anything that I want to eat. Now, I believe that a combination of diet and exercise to keep the weight off permanently is the key. In December, I injured my back, for example, and there was a two-month span that I could not jog, and I picked up eight pounds. See, my body retains ice cream. <laughs> but when you put them together, the diet and the exercise, now we're on the right track. There are four reasons people don't have goals. One is because of fear. The second one is because of their self-image. The third one is they've never been sold, and the fourth one is they do not know how. The first part of our goal seminar was a fun session. This is where we really get down to the nitty gritty. This is where we go to work. This is where the rubber meets the road. We get into the step-by-step -step process of setting those goals. There are a number of steps involved. Step number one is you print, print everything you want to be or do or have. Now, you got to be before you can do, and you got to do before you can have. The reason we want to print is simply because it requires greater concentration, and it will move it into our subconscious mind more firmly if we do the printing. I have no way of proving my next statement. I believe it is true. I've read enough to be convinced that it has a considerable amount of validity. I might overstate it slightly. I hope not. I personally am convinced that the greatest benefit which comes from specifically setting your goals is this. It directs your left brain, which means that you are freeing your right brain for the creativity which it is designed to do. What you will get from it, I believe, in the freeing of that right brain, when you automatically have that left brain directed towards the realistic goals of life, will be enormously valuable. Print everything you want to be or do or have. Put it on a sheet entitled Wild Idea Sheet. Now, just in case you're sitting there thinking, Ziegler, it'll take me three days to print down everything I want to be or do or have, let me assure you that by the end of one hour, you will have printed 95% of everything you will put on that list at this time. Now, during the next 24 to 48 hours, you might add a few more things. There won't really be that many but you let it sit after you print it, let it sit from 24 to 48 hours, and then at the end of that period of time, you might have added three or four things to it. 
But at the end of that time, you get the list back out and you write one word after each thing you've printed. The word is why. Why do I want to be or do or have? Now I've spent a couple of minutes telling you that you ought to print those things down. We will spend the rest of this entire session working at getting a lot of those things off. It's easy to print down the other things you want. But are they real goals, real burning desires in our life, or are they just whims? You see, the real task is going to come in finding out what it is we really want, that we really want to work on now, that will make a difference in our life. We're going to start eliminating those things. Now, this is going to sound just a little bit negative, but it really isn't negative. I might as well tell you, folks, you can't have everything you want to be and do and have. The other day, I was uh, going over some of my objectives, and I just wrote down some of the things that I want to do this year. This year. Let's look at some of them. First of all, I would like to take a couple of courses in Bible college. I'd like to have a lot more time with my wife, my children, and my grandchildren. Uh, I would like to be conducting more family seminars. I want to get my daily radio program functioning again. I want a daily newspaper column. I want to play golf five to six days each week. I want to... Uh, <laughs> I want to be uh, active uh, in a lot of the activities going on. For example, I would like to get the advertising of booze off television. I think that's a national disgrace. I would like to also be more active in helping clean up some of the things that are taking place on it. I would like to work in the political campaign and get qualified people in public office. I would like to spend more time fighting pornography. I want to spend more time with my staff. I want to write at least one book each year. I want to learn how to speak Spanish. I want to become socially involved with my neighbors. I want to read and research a minimum of three and preferably four hours each day. I want to spend at least an hour a day jogging and exercising and taking care of my health. I want to be active in the civic and social clubs around here. I want to be able to set a record for those people who are 61 and over at the Cooper Clinic. I want to go to both Russia and China, and I would love to eat Brahms French chocolate almond ice cream three times every day. <laughs> Now, to be realistic, and this is not being negative, I honestly don't think I can do all those things. Would most of you agree with that? So now, what have I got to do? I've got to say no to the good so I can say yes to the best. That's what we want to do, is we want to figure out a way that we can, in fact, work on those things which are really significant. Remember, we printed it down. Second thing we've done, we've asked the question, why? Now, if you cannot articulate in one sentence as to why you want to be or do or have, then that thing comes off the list. That's step number three, shorten that list. Now we've gotten the list shortened, we need to balance the list. As you look at it, make a determination as you go down the list, if it's a physical goal, designate it physical. If it's mental, put mental. If it's spiritual, put spiritual. If it's social, put social, financial, and career and family. Go down, there are seven areas for setting goals. You might have listed all of the goals in just one or two or three areas. Let me stress a point. If you set only one or two goals and really are deadly serious about it, the odds are prohibitive that you will, in fact, reach that goal if you'll follow the procedure. I'm not at all certain that you'll be very happy when you get there, but you will in all probability reach that goal. You can become warped in one particular area. You might have a higher standard of living, but where would your quality of life be? Step number five, we need to explore what we call the basic six. You ask yourself these questions. Will reaching 
This goal make me happier. Now, we need to pause a moment and differentiate between pleasure and happiness. Pleasure, generally speaking, is very short-lived. Every one of us needs to have some pleasure. But we also should ask ourselves this question when we get involved in pleasure. Can I repeat this pleasure indefinitely and be happy as a result? Very important question. For example, I'm very serious when I say I would like to eat some Brahms French chocolate almond ice cream three times every day. That would give me much pleasure. I do not know how happy I would be at 468 pounds. So that's the decision I got to make. Will reaching this goal make me healthier? Will reaching this goal make me more prosperous? Will reaching this goal make me more secure? Will reaching this goal make me more friends? Will reaching this goal bring me peace of mind? And then if you happen to have a family, will reaching this goal improve my family relationships? We need to keep that in mind. Now, any time you cannot answer yes to at least one of those questions, you need to strike more goals off, more of the things that you've printed. Very important, do not black out. Do not obliterate what you've written down or printed because that might not be a goal that is real for you right now. But two years from now, five years from now, ten years from now, it might. So you might set some goals right now, and it is not the proper time. That's the reason we go through all of this procedure. You might need to do some growing in order to reach your objectives a little later. We need to have the basic objective of being totally successful. Again, I'm talking about quality of life. I had a young man in my office a few months ago, and this young man had a hero. The young man himself was about 22 years old. His hero was about 29 years old. The young man in my office had modeled his life after his hero, and he was pursuing objectives the same as his hero was. Well, we talked there a few minutes, and we started evaluating. I asked the young man what he wanted. The bottom line is we all want the same thing. Everybody I've ever seen in my life wants to be happy. I've never yet met somebody who said, No, I want to be miserable. <laughs> Everybody wants to be healthy. Everybody wants to be at least reasonably prosperous. I bet some of you listening to this want to be unreasonably <laughs> prosperous, okay? <laughs> You know, I get a charge out of people who say, well, I don't want to make a lot of money. I just believe people that say that lie about other things, too. <laughs> and don't misunderstand, money's not everything. I mean, there's stocks and bonds and real estate and what have you. I've had money and I haven't had it, and overall, it's better to have it. But anyhow, everybody wants to be secure. Everybody wants to have friends. Everybody wants to have peace of mind. And if they're married, they want good family relationships. The young man confessed that those are the things he wanted. I said, well, now let's look at your role model. Let's look at your hero. Let's go down the list. How happy is he? He said, well, I don't really know, but I do know that he has ulcers. Well, I said, that answers that question. It also tells me how much peace of mind he has and how healthy he is. So let's take three of those things off. He's already missed out on them. I said, how many friends does he have? And he said, well, as far as I know, I'm the only one. And he said, I'm really not a friend. I just happen to admire what he's been able to do. So I said, well, we can scratch that one off too. He said, yeah. I said, what about his family relationships? Well, he separated from his wife. We went right down the list. This young man had chosen a hero who was successful in one area of his life. Good standard of living, low quality of life. That's what we want to keep in mind on this. Now, what is success? I would like to share with you what I believe success, real success is. You see, from my perspective, if I were to go all the way to the top in this profession which I have chosen, become the best in the whole world at what I do, and then one day had one of my children, I have three grown daughters and a grown son, had one of my children come to me and said, you know, Dad, it would have just meant everything to me if when I was growing up as a child that you would have had some time 
for me. You know, Dad, if sometimes at night, if you could have been there just to tuck me in, maybe to hug away some of my hurts and kiss away some of my tears. Had you ever been there in the morning to wake me up and play with me and take me to school and kiss me goodbye in the morning? Had you ever been around, Dad, to go to a school play or an open house at the school or a ball game? Had you been there to give me some of the advice you so freely gave to people all over the world? Had you been there, Dad, maybe my life would not have been the series of tragedies which it has. Had that happened to me, folks, I'd be one more broken-hearted daddy because I deeply love my children. I'm so grateful that I was able to dedicate raising positive kids in a negative world to my four as being the most positive kids I know anywhere. If in my drive for fame and fortune had I destroyed my health and sacrificed my integrity to gain the money, I would have said the price was prohibitive. Out of the question, I won't pay it. And if in my quest for the ring of fame, the career that I was so excited about, if in my pursuit of fame and fortune, had I ruptured the relationship with that beautiful redhead whom God gave me over 41 years ago, I'd be the most miserable human being you have ever seen in your life. Because I'll confess that after 41 years, not only do I deeply love my wife, not only is she by far the most important person on the face of this earth to me, but the reality is I have a crush on that redhead. Now, I know some of you young whippersnappers who've only been married 25 or 30 years <laughs> might find this difficult to relate to. But after 41 years, I find that my wife is more beautiful to me than she was on our wedding day. There's just not enough success around to have compensated for the destruction of that relationship. But the beautiful thing is this, in my heart and in my head, I know beyond any doubt that it is because of that relationship that I've been able to do most of the things that I've been able to do. I was never able to give that redhead financial security until after I was 47 years old. I was 20 years old when we got married. For 27 years, it was nip and tuck. Not once in 27 years did she ever say, well, you know, if we had the money, we could do like some of the other folks. It was always tomorrow is going to be better. I know that you can do it. There's no question about the fact that it is because of the relationship that I've been able to do some of the things I have been able to do. Statistically speaking, I might also point out that I can give you evidence a mile long which clearly says that people who have good relationships at home are more effective in the marketplace. And then, of course, when it gets down to goals, as St. Matthew said so long ago, what profited a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I'm talking about total success, ladies and gentlemen, and that's what we're looking at here in the setting of our goals. And if we don't set those goals, the chances are pretty strong we're not going to be reaching those goals. Now, the next step, step number six, is we need to remember that some goals must be big. We need some big goals to make us stretch, to make us reach. I love the story of gentleman Jim Corbett, the former heavyweight champion of the world. He was out doing his road work one morning when he saw a fisherman pulling in the fish. He was pulling in big ones and little ones. Corbett noticed him very carefully, and he was keeping the little ones and throwing the big ones back. Now, being a fisherman himself, he had never seen such conduct by a fisherman, so he ran over to him and he said, man, I don't understand this. 
I'm a fisherman. I've never seen anybody keep the little ones and throw back the big ones. Why are you doing it? The fisherman sadly shook his head. He said, man, I hate to do it, but he said, I don't have any choice. He said, I have to throw the big ones back because all I've got is just this little old bitty frying pan. <laughs> now, before you laugh too loudly, let me point out he's talking about you and he's talking about me. So many times we get the big goal, the big dream, the big idea, and no sooner do we get it than we say, oh, no, Lord, don't give me such a big one. All I've got is just this little old bitty frying pan. Besides that, you know, if, if it's any good, somebody else would already have thought about it, just give me one of those little ones. But, folks, we've got to have some big goals to make us stretch and use the ability which is inside of us. Some goals must be long range. Wednesday afternoon at 20 minutes after 5, I will get aboard an aircraft here at DFW, and I'll be headed for St. Louis, Missouri. For the first 20 minutes, we will be going straight to St. Louis. At that point, I have no idea where we'll be going. It won't be St. Louis. The direction of the wind and the velocity of the wind will change. The gravitational pull of the earth, the sun, the moon, and the stars will pull us slightly off course. So we will turn, the captain will turn the aircraft around, come back to Dallas, and we will land and start over. Somehow or another, I see a degree of skepticism on the face of our live audience here. <laughs> How many of you doubt that I've told the truth? Okay. Now, what the captain will do, very obviously, is he will make an adjustment. He will not change his decision to go. He will change his direction to get there. My brother really taught me that when Judge Ziegler does the same thing I do. And it really was one of those phrases that really is a grabber. You don't change your decision to go. You might have to change your direction to get there. Now, this is after you've really got the goal set. That is a very important consideration. You need to have long-range goals, and I must tell you why you've got to have long-range goals. There's trouble in front of you. I don't care what you do. You've got trouble in front of you. You think your kid's going to be the starting quarterback and is going to get cut on the first go-round. You think your new salesperson is going to break all kind of records and the bum's not even going to show up for the first day of training. You think you're going to get the promotion, you're going to get your walk-in papers. You think good things are going to happen to you and bad things happen instead. I mean, now, that's just a fact of life. How many of you have already experienced some of those things? Can I see your hands, all right? Now, let me tell you something. If you've got a long-range goal, then you treat those temporary setbacks like a pebble on the beach. If you don't have long-range goals, they will become the whole ocean front. The rule is simple. You go as far as you can see, and then when you get there, you will always be able to see further. You've got to have some long-range goals. You've got to have some goals which are small daily goals. Those are the nitty-gritty things. You know, everybody loves the big dream. Everybody loves the glamour of dreaming about the trip to Honolulu, dreaming about the trip around the world, dreaming about building their mansion, dreaming about having the first million and then the second million and so forth. But the reality is, in order for the big things to happen, you've got to have the little things designated along the way. Some goals need to be ongoing. Now, what's an ongoing goal? Well, your self-image, to build it, is an ongoing goal. Because even after you're an adult, even after you're 40 or 50 years old, you can have a devastating experience, I've seen it happen, and destroy the self-image. A man or woman might have been on the job 30 years, and then they change management, they're summarily dismissed, and they cannot find employment for the next six months or year or two years. The impact can be devastating. Your mate might walk out on you. That can be a devastating blow to the self-image. And so we need some ongoing goals. Our health is an ongoing uh, goal. My health is very definitely something I work on. I exercise at least five times each week. It's something I do on an ongoing basis. Spiritual goals are ongoing goals. Relationship goals are ongoing goals. 
Now, some goals have to be set with consultation. When I was going to lose the weight, I went over to the Cooper Clinic, and when Dr. Martin finished the examination, he said, you need to lose 37 pounds. I knew I needed to lose some weight. I could tell that by looking at a picture of me on the diving board. At least part of me was on the diving board. I knew that I had a problem, but I did not know exactly how much I needed to lose. I went to him for him to tell me exactly how much I needed to lose. You might need help in setting your financial goals. If you're a student, it might be that you would need help in developing your curriculum so that you can be certain to accomplish the objectives you've set out. Now, that's especially important since... Over 80% of all college graduates in America, 10 years after graduation, are earning their living in a field which is completely unrelated to what they majored in while they were in school. Wouldn't it have been magnificent had they gone through the process years and years ago? Some goals must be very specific. You can take the hottest day the world has ever seen. Take the most powerful magnifying glass that you can find in any store. Hold that magnifying glass over a pile of newspaper clippings on the hottest day and you'll never start a fire if you keep the glass moving. But the moment you hold it still, you harness the power of the sun, you magnify it through the glass and boom, you've got the fire. You've got to have some specific goals. How many of you are bird hunters? See your hands? When you go bird hunting, do you shoot the bird or do you shoot the flock? Tell me. You shoot the bird, don't you? If you shoot the flock, what will you have for supper? Roast beef, won't you? Okay. But it won't be bird. That's exactly right. You shoot the bird. Now, occasionally you'll get lucky and bring down another one, but you really got to go for the specific target. We've got to identify clearly the goals. Step number seven in this goal-setting process. Now, understand, we're marking things off all the way down the line. Step number seven, you need to check for negativity. Some goals are negative. Now, which goals are negative? Well, a goal is negative if it's too big. If it is out of reach, that's one thing. If it is out of sight, that's something else. Unrealistic expectations are the very seedbed of depression. I was speaking in Detroit a number of years ago. I finished this session. A young man, 24 years old, came to me, all excited. He said, you really got me turned on. I'm really excited, and I'm going to make a million dollars. Well, I said, that's wonderful. I hope you'll share it with me when you get it. He was a little perturbed because he thought I was, you know, poking a little fun at him. He said, no, I'm serious. I'm going to make a million dollars, and I'm going to make it this year. Now, here's a young man whom I happen to know did not have the $2,500 for the franchise fee on the product that I was teaching and training for that particular company on that day. Now, he's 24 years old, been working four years, had been unable to save $2,500 in four years of effort, but in the next 12 months, he's going to earn a million dollars. Now, you see, that's crazy. That had no foundation in fact or reason. So we worked with him at some little length on getting a more realistic goal because the truth is a million dollars in a year represents $20,000 a week. Assuming it took him one month to raise the $2,500 and he hadn't been able to do it in four years, I figured a month would be a fairly good job of raising the $2,500. At that point, he'd be $80,000 behind, and he would probably or possibly have thrown in the towel. We will be exploring what are the realistic goals that will still make us stretch. Now, the second thing, it could be negative if it is out of your field. I was speaking in Salt Lake City several years ago. Again, on a gold seminar, a young man, 30 years old, came to me. He was about 5 feet 7 inches tall, weighed about 210 pounds. He announced to me that his goal was to be the light heavyweight boxing champion of the world. I asked him how much experience he had had. 
Well, he said, Saturday, my brother-in-law and I were out in the backyard boxing around. He said, you can't believe how easily I handled him. I said, how much experience has he had? Well, he hadn't had any experience either. Now, here's a guy headed for the cemetery. He would get killed. There's no question about it. That's completely out of his field. It can be negative if it is completely out of your field of interest. Number three, it is negative if you've got to depend on luck in order to get there. Now, if you'll put a P in front of the letter L, that is a different thing. If it's pluck that's going to be required, you got a chance. Now, remember what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep the main thing the main thing. That is the main thing. And so what we want to do is gradually work on down to the things that we really want. Step number eight, we ask ourselves five questions. The first question is, is it really my goal? We have a lot of doctors and lawyers and preachers and plumbers and every other kind of profession on this earth who are not as good as they could be because they're not pursuing their own objectives. Their parents or grandparents or preachers or professors or friends that said, you know, you ought to be this. You're good at that and somebody else basically ends up setting their goals. There are occasions when two guys will graduate from school together, one of them gets a job first down at the plant or with the company, and he says to the other, you know, you ought to apply, this is a good company to work for. I got friends, benefits that are out of this world, and it's a nice environment to work in. And a lot of times with no more thought than that, he makes a choice. Five years, 10 years later, still there except they're stopping by the bar too frequently on the way home. They're bored to death with what they're doing. It isn't really their objective. Ask yourself the question, is it really my goal? Now, please understand that all goals in most cases cannot be yours. If you are a student or an employee or a member of some kind of a team, the coach might set your goal. You might want to be shooting more. He might want you to be passing off more. If you're an employee, the boss might say, I need this report in by Friday. Well, that's not necessarily your goal, but one of your goals is to keep your job, so I encourage you to have the report in by Friday. But I'm talking about the major things in life, those things which are really important to you, especially over a long haul, it should be your goal. The second question, is it morally right and fair to everyone concerned? Very important. The idea of abusing others, walking over them, taking advantage of them to achieve your objectives simply is not valid in this competitive world of ours today. We work in cooperation with others. You remember even the Lone Ranger had a buddy and he worked with his buddy. Is it morally right and fair to everyone concerned? Number three, will it take me closer to or further from my major objective? A couple of years ago, a young man whom I love very much was involved in a little conversation with me and the video desk had just come out. He was all excited about him and he had seen where some outfit was selling him for 120 bucks. Another outfit was selling him for 150. But the one that sold him for 150 claimed they'd meet any price that the 120 had. The 120 place would run out. This fellow said to me, Zig, how can I get the people who've got them at 150 to sell them to me for 120 like they promised? So we developed a little strategy. But I said to him, now, before you go get it, have you asked yourself the two questions? Now, questions two and three are marvelous when you're in a relationship uh, environment and when you really want to get to the nitty gritty in a hurry on some of your goals. He said, well, what two questions are you talking about? Now, let me hasten to throw in that I had a little advanced information or inside information. The young man is a carpenter. He is desirous to become a subcontractor. 
To do that, he needs an assortment of tools which are fairly expensive. He had no business talking about spending 150 bucks or 120 bucks on a play toy when he needed tools in order to further his career. I happen to know that his wife was uh, strongly opposed to him acquiring the video disc. I thought I'd ask him the question. He said, what question? I said, is it morally right and fair to everyone concerned? And he thought about it for a moment. He said, uh, well, yes, it is. I said, okay, question number two. Will it take me closer to or further from my major objective? He looked at me and said, you try and talk me out of it. <laughs> I said, no, I really am not. I am asking you a question so you can make the proper decision. If I tried to talk you out of it and succeeded in it, there'd be some resentment that would come from that. And I don't want any part of that. I want you, though, to ask yourself the right question so you can make that decision. Last summer, the redhead and I, along with Ron Isinger, the president of our company, and his wife, Ann, went to Japan to look at their schools and factories. Then we stopped by Hong Kong to do our bit for the local economy. <laughs> then we flew on to Malaysia, where I had a seminar, then on down to New Zealand, where I did a couple of more, and into Australia, where I had six seminars. Well, when we talked about it around the house, my son, who was a senior in college at that time, but who would be out when we made the trip, said, Dad, I sure would like to take that trip. I'd like to go with you. And I said, well, son, have you asked yourself the two questions? He said, what two questions? I said, number one, is it morally right and fair to everyone concerned? He said, well, Dad, you'd have to pay for it, so that's the question you're going to have to answer. <laughs> I said, that's fair enough. I said, question number two, will it take me closer to or further from my major objective in life? Well, my son's major objective is to become a PGA Touring Pro. We think that he has the ability. His pro thinks he's got the swing. I think he has the temperament. But, you know, there's a big step, and the odds are prohibitive against him. But that is his major objective. So when I said, will it take me closer to or further from my major objective to take you out of the practice course for one solid month and delay your career? Will it take me closer to or further from? He just grinned and said, Dad, I don't think I'll go. Well, we weren't going to take him anyhow. <laughs> but again, it is so much better for him to make that decision than for me to say, no, you can't go. He's much happier with it. He practiced much better while we were gone and all of those kind of good things. Number four, can I emotionally commit myself to start and finish this project? Folks, unless we get emotionally involved with that commitment, nothing really is going to happen. We're not logical people. We are emotional people. Can I emotionally commit myself to start and finish this project? And then the next one, can I see myself reaching this goal? Literal fact, I had that picture of that fella in those jockey shorts hanging up there on my bathroom mirror. I guess I saw that picture 10,000 times during that 10-month period of time. I, every time I'd go in the bathroom, there it was. I had that clear vision of exactly how I wanted to look. Now, that's important. You need to be able to visualize. You need to be able to see. And I'll deal with that a great deal in the next session. Now, the ninth step, once you've done all of these things, you see, you have been taking things off all the time. Now, what you've got to do is you need to work down to just four goals. Most of us can really only give complete effort to about four goals at the same time. But you might say, well, now, wait a minute, Zig, I've still got about 15 things on my list. And you work on them, well, this one, uh, I can't really get started on it now. Here's another one that's not quite as important as this one. You work it on down until you get to seven or eight things. 
Now, here's the way you work it all the way down to the four. You go through this process. First of all, you need to take inventory about where you are. On Thursday afternoon at 520, when I get aboard that aircraft headed to St. Louis, if the captain of the aircraft thinks that we're in Houston, I'm not going to make it to St. Louis. He needs to know we're in Dallas, Texas, if he's going to get us to St. Louis. You need to know where you are if you're going to reach your objective. You need to work through the goal process. First of all, in this process, you write down whatever the goal is. Now, I'm going to share with you the exact process I went through in the weight loss situation that I discussed in the previous session. First of all, identify my goal. It was to weigh 165 pounds and to have a 34-inch waistline. The date was for July the 1st, 1974. That's when I expected to reach that objective. I've got it identified. I've got it written down. Now, normally, you cannot put the time on a lot of your goals until you've gone through the entire process. I only put the date on it after I had gone through the process, but that was the objective that I had. Now, what are the benefits from reaching this goal? One of the major reasons people can't quit smoking or drinking or lose weight or whatever is because they emphasize the negative. The most important thing that you can do in this goal setting process is work it through what's in it for me. Now that might sound kind of selfish, but it is your goal that you're working for. And remember we've asked the proper questions before. Is it morally right and fair to everyone concerned? So it is not a question of you looking after you to the detriment of everybody else. What are my benefits for losing that weight? Well, first of all, the odds are strong that I'm going to look better. That's a benefit. Second benefit, everything else being equal, I will live longer. Third benefit, I will have more energy and I will feel better. Fourth benefit, I will undoubtedly be sick less. Historically speaking, that worked out. It is 100% true. Until I had uh, a couple of uh, surgeries, which had nothing to do with my diet and exercise, and that little back problem last December, which was minor, I had gone 15 years by missing one day of work. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that when you take care of your health, things are going to happen that are going to be in your best interest. Now, step number three, what are the obstacles and mountains I've got to climb to reach this goal? What am I going to have to do to lose this weight? Well, I've got some basic considerations. First of all, I've always been on a seafood diet. In other words, when I'd see food, I'd eat it, as most of you know. As I often told people, I was a light eater, meaning when it got light, I started eating. <laughs> I uh, never saw food I didn't like. I make friends with all of it. The only thing I don't like is green olives, anchovies, pimento cheese, and caviar. And you can eat a well-balanced meal without any one of those four being added to the list, I'll guarantee you. So what are my obstacles? Those are the obstacles. Number one, I just like too many foods, all foods as a matter of fact. Number two, my schedule is very irregular. Finishing uh, late at night like this recording, for example. Now, as you can tell, I speak pretty fast. I go at about 280 words a minute with gust up to about 550. <laughs> In the process, according to the psychologist, I burn more raw energy in a one-hour presentation than a working man does in an eight or a 10-hour day. So when I do a three or four hour seminar, I burn some energy. When I get through here this evening, though I ate just before I got here, I'll be starved again. Now what I really want to do is eat a big old meal. What I am going to do is eat a piece of fruit. I've got to deal with the obstacles which are there in front of me. That was one of them. Another obstacle was my tendency to eat entirely too fast. I'm a shovel eater. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about or not, but I just shoveled it in. Now, what are the skills or knowledge which is required to reach this goal? 
Well, all I really need to know is about diet and exercise. I only need to know two things. So I wrote that down, diet and exercise. Who are the individuals, groups, companies, and organizations to work with to reach this goal? Well, first of all, I had to work with the redhead. I had to coordinate my eating and my jogging to fit in the family plan. Second, I had to work with Laurie Majors, my administrative assistant, and when she schedules my activities, she schedules me to fly in in time for me to do my jogging. I'm frequently invited to dinner on these uh, seminars, and Laurie always says to them, provided you give him time between the seminar and the uh, dinner for him to go do his running. We scheduled it very, very carefully. Now, when you start talking about people to work with to reach your goal, let me remind you that somebody told Albert Einstein that two plus two is four. Let me remind you that somebody taught Joe Lewis how to hold his guard up. Somebody taught Mozart the scale. Somebody taught Sir Edmund Hillary how to climb the little hill before he ever got to Mount Everest. Many times we simply need somebody to work with and teach us. Now, step number six, what was my plan of action to reach this goal? This is the one that really gets into the nitty-gritty. This is where we really find out if we're serious about reaching that goal. What was my plan of action? Number one, I decided because of my love for breads and sweets that I wasn't about to eliminate them completely from my diet. So I became a once-a-week eater of my desserts. Every Sunday after church, I would make a beeline for the Brahms French chocolate almond ice cream place. Now, as you well know, some ice cream scoopers are better scoopers than other scoopers. And so, since they were frequently crowded, when I would get there, you know, I'd wait in line and I'd watch the scoopers and I would find out who was the best scooper. And if I got up there and had a bad scooper fixing to scoop my ice cream, I'd just kind of turn my back until a good scooper came up. And then I'd turn around and I'd say, I'll take a double dip of that good old Brahms French chocolate almond ice cream. Oh, I'll tell you, a goal within a goal. I could not wait until Sunday afternoon to get to the Brahms French chocolate almond ice cream place. That is part of my plan of action. Now, that's a plus, you see. My plan of action was when I finished late at night on seminars, I would travel with a grapefruit. Now, that's not the best traveling companion you can find, but I discovered that a grapefruit, a large grapefruit, only has about 110 calories. I would take the edge off of my appetite, and I would go to bed at least reasonably satisfied with that. Number three, I learned to put my fork in front of the plate. Now, Emily Post would turn over in her grave at this. But what I had to do is put my fork in front of my plate. I would reach over and I'd pick up the fork. I'd take a fork full of food. I'd put it in my mouth and I would back away. I would force myself to have to think about every bite of food I was taking. That slowed me down dramatically. The minute I get through, I'd hop up. I'd scoot to the bathroom and brush my teeth. Did it for two reasons. Number one, at my home, when we finish a meal, we sit around and we chat a bit. And if there's food on the table and empty in my stomach, the food on the table soon took care of the empty in my stomach. So I had to take immediate action. I would go back and brush my teeth. The toothpaste has a little sweet in it, and so that gave me just a little bit of satisfaction there. Another plan of action I had, in those days I was eating about six meals each week on the airplane. Now on the airplane what they do is they bring the food, the tray out, they've got the bread and the dessert right there. Now as you might can tell, I'm a very strong-willed person. It does not bother me at all to have the bread and the dessert there on the tray as I eat the meal. But I'm even more reward-oriented. And I was so proud of myself for saying no to the bread and dessert while I was eating the meal that I rewarded myself by eating it when it was all over. <laughs> now, <laughs> that meant I ended up with a little problem there, did I not? Now, how did I deal with that particular problem? Very simple. When they would bring the food out, the tray, I would instantly pick up the bread and the dessert. I would give it to the person who had brought it to me, and I'd say, take it away quick. 
Now, you might say, Ziegler, that is an awful lot of detail. I'm not sure I want to know that much about it. Let me tell you something. I will get into this more in the next session where we go into reaching your goals. But let me tell you, when you go through all of the process, when you work through each one of your goals, let's say you've got seven or eight or nine, you work all of them through that process, when you start developing that plan of action, what you will discover is that there are some of the goals you've got there that at this time simply are not practical for you to work on. Now the question is, doesn't it make more sense to eliminate them after working on them an hour and a half than it does to strive for them six months and then give up in frustration? See, what we're wanting to do is get you zeroed in on what is important right now for you to work on that will let you accomplish your objectives. Now, let me say this. Those details are absolutely critical. I can look you right in the eye and say to you that since December the 1st of 1986, with the exception of three days last June and one day last February, I have worked on my goals every single day. I can tell you where I've been, what I've been doing, what I've been working on, and what I've accomplished, with the exception of those four days since December the 1st of 1986. Now, I'd always been fairly conscientious about my goals. I've been doing it for years. But I can tell you without any mental reservation, when you start doing it this way, when each evening, and I get into the reaching aspect next, but when each evening you take certain steps, once you've gotten those goals set, I can tell you that you can accomplish dramatically more than you've been accomplishing in the past. Let me say congratulations, folks. A goal properly set is halfway reached. Thank you. A number of years ago, Mary Crowley made a statement. She said that one person with a commitment is worth more than a hundred who only have an interest. I'm convinced that people who make commitments to reach their goals are the ones who are going to reach them. A number of years ago, a young coach at the University of South Carolina was fired after his first season on his first job. Not only did the head coach say, no more for you here, uh, but he advised him to get out of coaching. He said, let's face it, you just don't have it. But the young coach had set his goal. He had made a commitment. He had said, someday I'm going to coach at the University of Notre Dame. Ohio State gave him a chance, and he was an assistant there for a couple of years. And William and Mary called him, and he was their head coach. And then North Carolina State University called him. And for four years there, he had the best one lost record they'd ever had. From there, he went into the pros and coached the New York Jets for a season, but he really missed coaching the young men and helping mold their character. And then the University of Arkansas called him and had a phenomenally successful career there. He built the best one-loss record they had ever had. He went to the Orange Bowl, I believe it was in 1979. And before he went down to play the University of Oklahoma, the media had speculated that it would be a mismatch, that Oklahoma simply was too powerful. To compound the problem, three offensive players, as a matter of fact, the entire offense of that Arkansas team were caught with a woman in the room. They explored, investigated, discovered that it was absolutely true, and the coach immediately dismissed all three players. The media again speculated that what he should do is decline the invitation of the Orange Bowl, let somebody else accept the invitation who would be a worthy opponent for the Oklahoma team. 
But the coach was a committed man. He looked at what he did have left and didn't worry about what he did not have. They accentuated the positive, if you will. They developed a specific game plan. The rest is history. They won the game. I believe it was by about 31 to 6. He left the University of Arkansas and became the head coach at the University of Minnesota. Now, when he accepted the Minnesota assignment, he said to them, I will take the assignment provided you will give me one out. And that is that if the University of Notre Dame calls me to be their head coach, and if I take this team to a bowl within two years, there he is with those goals again. Well, two years later, the University of Minnesota was invited to play in a bowl, and the University of Notre Dame called Lou Holtz to be their head coach. Now, the interesting thing is this. They called him to be their head coach the day he dismissed those three players from his team when he was at the University of Arkansas several years earlier. Now, they made their decision then. They didn't put the call into him. But when that happened, they said, here is a man who is interested in building character and developing leaders. There's the man we want to be our coach the next time we have an opening as the head coach at Notre Dame University. I'm obviously talking about Lou Holtz. I happen to know Lou quite well. We've been on seminars together. We've corresponded together. We've spent a little time together. He said that there never was any doubt in his mind about dismissing those players. It was the right thing to do. What I'm saying is this. When you've got a solid base with a solid commitment and solid objectives, you've got a much better chance of reaching your goal. But it does take those commitments. When I wrote my book, See You at the Top, the first words I wrote were, as I said earlier, you can go where you want to go, do what you want to do, and be like you want to be. When I worked on the goal segment in there, I put in the book that I weighed 165 pounds, that I had a 34-inch waistline. The moment I wrote that and it was typeset, I had a 41-inch waistline and weighed over 200 pounds. I had made a commitment to get that weight off, and I put it in print that I was going to do exactly that. Not only that, but when I'd finished the first summation of the book and had written the chapter headings and a little bit of the content, I sent it to three major publishers knowing that they would really be elated to get this book from this unknown author. I knew that in all reality, those three publishers would get in a bidding war and they would fight each other about who's going to have the honor of publishing this book. You can imagine my shock, chagrin, and disappointment when I got letters from all three of them saying, we don't think the book was going to sell. Well, I knew better. But folks, there's one thing for me to say to the publisher, publish it. If it sells, pay me my royalties. If it does not sell, well, gee, I'm sure sorry about that. It's one thing for me to get them to invest their money, but the question is, Zegler, do you really believe this philosophy that you've been talking about all over the country? Do you really believe that this book will sell? I had to make a decision. I decided since no one else would publish a book, I'd publish it myself. A friend of mine said, Zig, if you sell 25,000 copies, you got a bestseller. Well, that appealed to me enormously. I decided to print up 25,000 copies. Now, I don't know what you know about book publishing, but let me tell you something very basic about it. First of all, the first copy will cost you more than the next 24,999 copies. <laughs> the second thing about it is those 24,999 copies cost a whole bunch of money, especially if you don't have it. I decided, though, that I believed the book would sell. I decided to go ahead and publish that book. That is commitment. Can you imagine me with a warehouse full of books saying I weighed 165 pounds and I come waddling out at 202? I would still have a warehouse full of books. Let me tell you what human nature is like. I lie to you one time about one thing. And from here on in, you're going to have a question mark after everything I tell you. Is this not so? 
You lie to me one time about one thing, and I know it is a deliberate lie. I'm going to put a question mark after everything you tell me from here on in. Had I not lost that weight, I could well imagine a lot of people looking at me and reading the book, and this says 165, and I'm seeing 202. I would imagine them saying, I wonder what else he lied about. Ladies and gentlemen, you must make the commitment. That's step number one if you expect to reach your goal. Step number two, you need to keep that daily detailed accountability. I can say it 4,000 different ways, but the bottom line is this. Unless you discipline yourself on a daily basis to keep records of what you're doing, it will take you a maximum of 10 minutes. Unless you discipline yourself to do these things, so the chances are very, very strong that you are not going to reach your goals. You simply lose sight of what you say is extremely important to you. Then there's this other thing each evening, and that is your plans for tomorrow. Just before I came down here this evening, I placed a telephone call to my friend Lon Sheely up in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Those of you who are close enough can see in this picture, there is a man seated at a desk. There is a high stack of five by eight cards alongside of him. I have not counted them, but Lon Sheely tells me there are 3,100 hundred cards in that stack. Those represent his daily commitment every day for the last 3,100 days of his career. <coughs> Let me tell you what I'm getting at. A number of years ago, a consultant named Ivy Lee called on a man named Charles Schwab, who was the president of U.S. Steel. He said, I know as busy as you are, Mr. Schwab, you're going to need all the help you can get in having your activities directed at the things which are the most important and the most profitable for you and for the company. I will give you an idea which will dramatically increase your effectiveness. The entire interview lasted 15 minutes. The idea Ivan Lee gave to Charles Schwab was this. Each evening before you go to bed, list the six most important things which you have to do tomorrow. Tomorrow morning then you start working on number one. And if it takes you all day long to complete number one, remember you have already decided that is the most important thing for you to be doing. What Lon Sheely said to me was, is that for 3,100 consecutive days, and assuming that you work about 230 days each year, you've got about 15 years of cards stacked up right there. I asked Lon, did it work? He said, Zig, the results speak pretty well for themselves. Lon is the new retired vice chairman of Star Buildings. He retired as the president. He's kind of on a consultant basis there, goes in from time to time. He said, you know, Zig, a number of years ago, Peter Drucker made a couple of observations that fit this down to the T. He said, number one, know thy time. That's what we're talking about with this. Number two, you focus on the contribution that you can make. Focus on the contribution. Know your time. That's exactly what you are doing with this. Now, once each week, you remember we're only working on four to six things, but once each week, you need to look at all of the goals which are still on your list. For example, there are some 34 things on my goals list right now. I do not work on all of them every week. That is impossible. Some of them are not designed to be worked on every week. But each week, I make a decision which one of them I'm going to be working on this week. You need to review them. Now, during the course of the week, in my performance planner, if I don't do anything at all that day on that goal, what I do is I write nothing in red. 
at the end of the week, I can spend five seconds and I can just glance at what I have done that week and I can instantly know if I'm headed for trouble. If I miss it one day, that's not a big deal. If I miss it two days, maybe I better start exploring because I'm headed for some trouble there. Step number two is you get involved in this daily detailed accountability. I say it again, it will take you only about 10 minutes each evening to do these. Number three, if you're going to reach your goals, you have got to start with a solid foundation. Now that foundation is honesty and character and integrity and loyalty and trust and love or faith for trust there for some of you. I was in Calgary, Canada once here about, oh, I guess it's five or six years ago. Had a chance to go up on Calgary Tower to have dinner. When we stepped on the elevator, the little cassette recording came on. The recording said, this tower is 626 feet high. Now, I cannot visualize 626 feet straight up unless I think of two football fields and then 26 more feet. Now, I can relate to that. So that was a picture I had of it. The recording said this structure weighs 13,000 tons and 7,000 of those tons are underground. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you've got a foundation like that. You can go 626 feet up in the air or even higher. Go to downtown Dallas or any city in the world and a good engineer can look at a hole in the ground and tell you how wide, how broad, and how tall the building is going to be just by looking at the kind of foundation they're going to have. I can tell you, I don't care whether your future lies in athletics or entertainment or music or sales or education or law or medicine, it makes zero difference what your future is in, where your goals are. But I can tell you this, if you've got a solid foundation to build on, the odds are dramatically increased that you're going to reach your goals. I'd like to share this with you, personal opinion. I believe it has more than just an opinion as far as validity is concerned. Dr. Bill Kirby, Commissioner for Education for the State of Texas, went to Japan about a year ago. I read an article about his visit when he came back. I'd been reading a lot of the books. Japan is number one, many articles and other things about what the Japanese are doing. But you know, it's one thing to hear things, it's something else to see those things. That's the reason we went by Japan on the other trips. What Dr. Kirby said was starting in the first grade and going through the 12th grade, one hour a day, First grade through 12th grade, the Japanese teach a one-hour course. It teaches their kids the importance of honesty and character and integrity and positive thinking and goal setting and free enterprise and responsibility and respect for authority and respect for elders. What they are doing is really establishing from the very beginning what the work ethic is all about. Now, please don't misunderstand this. I would not live in Japan. There's nothing quite like America. But I believe fervently, ladies and gentlemen, that we can learn some lessons from them. And if we don't learn those lessons, we're going to be in trouble. Here's a little nation half the size of Texas has 120 million people, no natural resources, and yet they're the largest creditor nation in the world. Eight of the top 10 publicly held corporations in the world are Japanese. Eight of the top 10 banks in the world are Japanese. Economically, they're the dominant factor in the world today. Now, why is it? There might be a lot of reasons, but I'm absolutely convinced that this is one of the major reasons right here. We went into the plant over there that manufactures Quasar TV. They have roughly 2,000 employees. We were there in July. 
In June, they had set their goal. That plant was to produce 11,500 ideas for improvement. And their goal was that 65% of them were to be usable. In other words, none of this wild, off-the-wall stuff. Very definite objectives. They had just published their goals. They had come up with 11,700 new ideas. But only 62 of them were usable. Now, what am I saying with all of this? I'm saying that these principles work for a nation, for a family, for an individual, and for a company, but you got to have a solid foundation. Uh, Dr. Mortimer Feinberg wrote a book. It's entitled Corporate Bigamy. He's a PhD from New York City. In his book, he tells of interviewing 100 top CEOs in the Fortune 500. He asked the question, what is necessary to go to the top in your career and stay there? And the consensus was this. You build your career on honesty and character and integrity, and they threw in the word motivation. They summed it up by saying anybody who thinks they can go to the top and stay there who's not honest is dumb. That's about as strong as you can get. And yet over 70% of all of the business men, they're not as hard on you ladies, over 70% of the business men depicted on television are depicted as con artists and or crooks. The exact opposite of the reality of life. Step number four, if you want to reach your goals, you need to change your vocabulary. I so well remember when that opportunity clock would sound off every morning at 5.30. I was jogging in the morning in those days. That opportunity clock would sound off and I'd reach over there and shut it off. And, you know, a lot of people have asked me, now tell me the truth, Zegler, did you really enjoy getting up and doing all of that running? I'm going to tell you I absolutely hated it. Clock would sound off, I'd reach over and shut it off, and I'd lay there thinking to myself, Zegler, what's a 46-year-old fat boy like you doing getting up running all over the neighborhood? <laughs> then I'd look down at that 41-inch waistline, and I'd say, Zegler, do you want to look like you, or do you want to look like the guy in the jockey shorts? Well, I didn't want to look like me, so I would crawl out of bed feeling like a martyr. I mean, did I ever feel like a martyr? I'd put on that fancy running outfit, and I'd head for the front door, and I'd start jogging. But I was grumbling all the way. What you trying to do out here? Go kill your silly self out here. But you said you were going to do it, and so you're going to do it. Oh, and don't you think I didn't tell people all over the country about the sacrifice I was making, how I would get up in the morning and do this thing because I was committed to do it, and if I'm committed to do it, I'm going to do it. Oh, if I said it once, I said it a thousand times. I would raise my voice and say, you got to pay the price. What a bunch of baloney that is. <laughs> Sound like a dying calf in a snowstorm. The reality is, I was in Portland, Oregon. Beautiful spring day. Temperature about 78 degrees. High noon. I was running on the campus there at Portland State University. And as I was jogging that day, all of a sudden, I became aware of the fact that I was breathing easily. The ground was flowing smoothly beneath my feet. And that day, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time I understood, you don't pay the price for good health. You enjoy the benefits of good health. You don't pay the price for success. You pay the price for failure. I've never seen a happy failure. You don't pay the price for a good marriage. You pay the price for a poor one. You enjoy the benefits of a good one. If you really want to reach your goal, what I'm saying is you need to change your vocabulary. You do. Step number five. If you want to reach your goal, you need to divide it into small bites. When I was writing the book and losing the weight, when the doctor told me to lose the 37 pounds, he didn't tell me how long to take to do it. I was writing the book at that point, and I figured, based on what I'd already done, that it would take me 10 months to write the book. 
So I said, well, if it's going to take me 10 months to write the book, I'll just lose the weight as I'm writing the book, and I'll break it down, and I will lose three and seven-tenths pounds a month. Now, remember earlier we said you've got to be able to see yourself as already reaching there. You've got to emotionally commit yourself to do it and be able to visualize believing that you can get there. Well, I knew that I could lose three and seven-tenths pounds a month. You see, that's not even a pound a week. I was totally, completely, 100% confident that I could do it. I was so confident, as a matter of fact, that I didn't even bother to get started for 29 days. <laughs> How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? When I was a boy down in Yazoo City, Mississippi, we lived next door to some rich folks. I know they were rich for two reasons. Number one, they had a cook. Number two, the cook had something to cook. And during the Depression, that was a sure sign of wealth, I'll guarantee you. I was over there for lunch one day, as I tried to be every day. <laughs> and don't misunderstand, even though there was a Depression on, we certainly had plenty to eat at my house. I, I know we had plenty, because if I ever passed my plate for seconds, they'd always tell me, uh, no, you've had plenty. So I know we had plenty. <laughs> Cook brought the biscuits out, and this is not an exaggeration. Those biscuits were no thicker than my wristwatch. And I looked at him. I said, Maud, what on earth happened to your biscuits? She read back, gave that big old tummy laugh, and said, well, I'll tell you about those biscuits. She said they squatted to rise. <laughs> but she said they just got cooked in the squat. <laughs> You know anybody gets cooked in the squat? You know anybody who's a half a minder and a gonna doer? You know, they're gonna do this when, or they're a half a mind to do that now, but you know, the half a minders and the gonna doers invariably end up being the never doers. You ever see the individual, you know, that said, I really want to get involved in this project, but it's really almost time for the kids to get out of school. When the kids get out of school, I'm having to take them to so many of the parties now. And when school is out, then I'll really get busy. When school is out, they say, well, you know, I didn't realize it, but now I got to take them somewhere it looks like all the time. I have to do it more now than I did when they were in school. Wait till the kids get back in school, then I'll really get busy. Kids get back in school and they say, well, for the first time in 23 years, dear old Central High has finally got a win in football season. And you got to support the kids, you know that. Wait till after football season is over, then I'll really get involved. Football season ends and they say, well, you know, here it is, Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's, and people just don't want to be bothered this time of the year. Wait till after the holidays, then we can all get a fresh start. After the holidays, they say, well, you know, it's the weather. Have you ever seen weather like this around Dallas or St. Louis or San Diego or New Jersey or wherever? Uh, you know, you just don't know from one day to the next. It's just a mess. Wait until the weather kind of settles down. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking I've lost interest. But just, 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 just a minute. Let me tell you the way I'm seeing. Now, here's the way I do things. I get everything all lined up in the proper order and get all of my ducks in a row. I get my plans made. And then when I do get started, man, I really get after it. I mean, I just found that works better for me. Now, some of these other people, they might be ahead of me right now, but I mean, this is what works best for me. Wait till after the weather settles down, then I'll really get after it. The weather settles down, they say, well, here it is, Easter time. And you know, Easter time is family time, and you said it yourself, family is most important. Wait till I've had some family time, then they have some family time, and they say, well, you know, at long, long last, we got some decent weather, and I haven't hit a golf ball or wet a hook in I don't know when. And you know yourself, you can't work all the time. Fellers got to have some time off. Wait till I hit a few golf balls, and then, man, I'll really get after the hit a few golf balls. Then you know what they say? Well, it's time for the kids to get back out of school. Now, folks, you can put this in your pipe and smoke it, as we'd say down home. The folks who wait for Aunt Matilda to move out or John to get on the day shift. The people who wait for the primaries to end or the new senator to be elected. The people who wait for the rate of interest to drop or inflation to slow down. The people who wait for the new advertising campaign to get started or the new model to come out. The people who wait on changes out there before they make decisions and take actions internally are invariably going to end up getting cooked in the squat. <laughs> what I'm saying is we need to start it right now. You know what I discovered? I discovered that if I lost one and nine-tenths ounces a day, that ten months later, to the inch, to the ounce, and to the day, I would lose the weight. And that is exactly 
what happened right there. Exactly. My book, see you at the top, 384 pages. Sold, counting foreign editions, over 2 million copies. I wrote one and one-fourth pages a day, every day, for 10 months. Let me tell you how to build a magnificent marriage. It's not the great honeymoon. It's not the big Christmas or the big vacation. It's the little acts every day of time and respect and affection and courtesy that you show to each other. You raise positive kids in a negative world by the daily injections of love and direction and concern you have for your kids. You build a magnificent career, regardless of what it is that you're doing, by the little things that you do every day that are designed to make a difference. It is the series of little things that will determine whether you get there or not. Now, let me stress something here. What I'm really talking about is simply a direction and an organization of your time frame. I'm suggesting that you, by following these procedures, will be taking control. 90% of all independent people, particularly in the world of sales and entrepreneurial organizations and medicine and law and so many of the other things, are dictated to and subjected to the whims of just about everybody that comes and goes, imposing on their time and giving them things to do or dumping loads on them, and they don't know how to get out of it. When we've got direction in our lives, for some reason, busy people seem to be in control of their lives. You need to become a time miser. Napoleon said that he was able to win all of those battles because he understood the value of five minutes. Now you might think, but uh, Zig, where do I find all of this time? You said we ought to be reading every day, we ought to be working on our goals every day, we ought to be learning a new word every day. Where do you find your time? Now, as some of you know, I have a fairly low opinion of television. I believe that it is an extraordinarily detrimental force in our lives in most cases because we let it be a detrimental force in our lives. It controls us instead of us controlling it. Some authorities have estimated that as much as 70% of the time when we're watching television, we're watching something in which we have no interest. We come home to watch The Cosby Show, which incidentally is an excellent show. I have already seen it three times. It is a good show. We sit there and watch it, then we say, well, I wonder what comes on now. We watch that, then let's flip channel and see what's over here. And the first thing you know, it's 10.30, and we've invested four hours in it. Let me tell you, if you'll do one simple thing. On Sunday afternoon, when you get your paper, pull the TV guide out. Mark those programs in which you have a real interest in watching. Set your goal to watch it. But keep that turn-off deal in your hand. And the minute that program is over, switch it off and start talking to your mate and your children, reading the good material that will make a difference, spending that time in a constructive way. When you break goals into increments and start controlling your time, things begin to happen. Step number six, you need to shape up. There have been all kinds of studies done on this, and there is a definite correlation among the most successful people in this country between the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. People who take care of themselves physically. A close friend of mine, whom I often refer to, Dr. Forrest Tennant, the number one drug authority in this country. When Howard Hughes and Elvis Presley died, they sent the autopsies to Dr. Tennant for him to tell them what was there. As the largest research staff, the largest number of drug addicts in his clinics, is a consultant for the NFL, is a consultant for NASCAR, for the Los Angeles Dodgers, for the Justice Department, etc., etc., etc. Dr. Tennant deals at the very top of the corporate ladder. 
He says that today it almost never happens that the CEOs smoke cigarettes or drink booze or get involved in drugs. Not only that, but one recent study revealed that their interest in the spiritual aspects of life are considerably higher than in the general population as well. In addition to that, these people are committed to what they're doing. They do not have time for a lot of foolishness and be able to spend their time with their families. Step number six, shape up physically, shape up mentally, and shape up spiritually. They're all so closely tied together. Now, I'm somewhat of a fanatic on this bit about physical conditioning because it has made such a dramatic difference in my life. My energy level is so much higher. I can do things today at age 61 that I literally could not do when I was 25 years old. January the 5th, 1986, I went back to the Cooper Clinic for my physical. I go about every 18 months. While there... They discovered that I have a resting heart rate of 41. I stayed on the treadmill longer than any active player in the National Football League who's taken the treadmill test, and lots and lots of them have. I mention that just simply to say this. The time and effort that you invest in getting in shape does make a difference. I finish all of that bragging, and that's all it is. This is bragging. And Dr. Cooper, who's now a close friend of mine, will look at me and he said, yeah, Zig, that's pretty good. But let me tell you, Zig, about this 65-year-old lady. She lives right here in Dallas. She started jogging when she was just 59 years old. She just completed her 10th marathon. Two of them were 50 miles long. I picked myself up off the deck and he says... And let me tell you about this little 14-year-old schoolgirl, Zig. She stayed on the treadmill so much longer than you did that I'm not even going to tell you what it was. It would embarrass you. <laughs> I hope you understand what I'm saying. I'm not really bragging on Zig or the 14-year-old girl or the 65-year-old lady. What I am saying is that inside of you, there is incredible potential, physically, mentally, and spiritually. It is not easy. But again, when you're tough on yourself, life is going to be infinitely easier on you. Step number seven. If you really want to reach your goals, you've got to know how to respond to disappointment. In the fall of 1987, the University of Notre Dame was playing Penn State University. They were in the fourth quarter. Penn State was ahead. Notre Dame was driving towards the end zone. Now, one of the finest men in college football is Joe Paterno. He's a gentleman highly respected, much admired by everybody. His team went on that year, you know, to win the national championship in their game with the University of Miami. I admire Coach Paterno enormously, but Lou Holtz is my buddy. And so when Penn State was driving down, I was really pulling for Notre Dame. And they drove all the way down. There's about a minute left in the game. The tight end from Notre Dame broke completely free into the end zone. The quarterback hit him with a pass. I mean, hit him right in the hands. He catches it. Notre Dame wins. He drops it. Penn State wins. He dropped the ball. Ten of the eleven players on the Notre Dame team did everything they were supposed to do. One of them dropped the ball. It will be very interesting to see what happens in life to the young man who dropped the ball and to the quarterback. Knowing Lou Holtz as I do, as wise as he is and as much compassion as he has and his skill in human relations and his natural fairness, I have an idea that long ago he's enabled the young man to put it behind him. But I tell the story primarily for this reason. There are going to be those occasions in life when you do everything that you're supposed to do and somebody else is going to drop the ball. That's part of life. 
But it is not what happens to us, it's how we handle what happens to us that does make the difference. Step number eight, if you're going to reach your goals, you must discipline yourself. One of the toughest things you will ever do is what I'm now going to suggest. When you arise in the morning, you need to take your goal planner, your performance planner, whatever it is that you're using, and put it under your pillow. So that that night when you get ready to lay down, you cannot go to sleep until you've spent the 10 minutes recording your activities of the day and planning those six things you're going to be working on tomorrow. You need to discipline yourself to do that. A lot of people say, I will do it when I'm motivated to do it. But let me say again, motivation follows the action. Motivation incidentally also creates energy. Dr. Tennant says that when you jog, you activate the pituitary glands. The pituitary glands flood the system with endorphins. And there, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the most exciting events that take place. There are also some other factors involved there. A lot of things happen when you are listening to cassette recordings and when you're exercising, taking care of yourself. But discipline yourself to do these things. Number nine, I touched on a little bit earlier, and that is that when obstacles arise, you change your direction to reach your goal. You do not change your decision to get there. Step number 10, you need to share certain goals and not share other goals. Over the years, I've probably been asked that one question more than almost anything else. Who do you share your goals with? Here's the basic rule. This is not said in concrete, but I believe it's very, very valid. You share your go-up goals very, very carefully. If you want to be the starting quarterback, the number one salesperson, write the book, create the music. If they're go-up goals, you want to share them only with those individuals whom you have every reason to believe will encourage you in that goal. For example, if we have two salespeople here representing the same company, and we've got John and Paul representing the same company selling the same product. John says to Paul, I'm going to be number one this year. I'm going to sell more than anybody. No, Paul's sitting over there thinking, in a pig's eye you are. I'm going to be number one. Now, you share that goal with your sales manager, he will give you the kind or she will give you the kind of encouragement that you really need. Be very careful with your go-up goals that you share them with only those people whom you have every reason to believe will give you the encouragement you need. Now, your give-up goals you will share with everybody in sight. Now, what's a give-up goal? You're going to give up smoking, give up drinking, give up overeating, give up losing your temper, give up being rude. If it is a give up goal that has to do with self-improvement, put yourself on the spot. Tell everybody, you know, I lost my temper for the third time this month. I flat am going to get better control of myself. I want you to help me do that. Or I'm going to quit eating too much. I'm going to lose some of this weight. Please help me avoid some of the temptations. Share them very, very carefully. Number 11, to reach your goals, you need to become a team player. How many of you have ever seen a flock of Canadian geese flying overhead? If you will watch them carefully, you'll notice about three things about those Canadian geese. First of all, you notice they always fly in a V formation. Second, you will notice that they always have one leg of that V which is longer than the other. And the third thing you will always notice is that from time to time, there appears to be some confusion in the flock. How many of you have noticed those things, okay? How many of you have ever wondered why one leg of that V was always longer than the other one? Well, let me explain. One leg is longer because it has more geese in it. <laughs> now, the reason they fly in a V formation is they have discovered in wind tunnel tests 
that the V formation will permit them to fly about 70% further than they otherwise could fly. The reason that there appears to be confusion in the flock is because the lead goose grows tired fighting that headwind. And so what they do is they periodically rest the leader. And that's the reason for the apparent confusion. They work together. It's a team effort. I mentioned Joe Paterno a few moments ago. They are one of the most team-oriented teams in the country. As you undoubtedly know if you're a football fan, their uniforms are not the classiest uniforms in collegiate ranks. As a matter of fact, you might put them fairly close to the bottom. Joe Paterno is one of the few coaches who does not put the names of his players on the jerseys. They strictly go by numbers. They don't look for the outstanding star. They look for outstanding players, but they believe in the team concept. When Penn State in 1988 played for the 1987 championship against the University of Miami. They played against Vinny Testaverde, the Heisman Trophy winner, reputed to be the finest collegiate player in the last five to ten years. But Penn State, the team, beat Testaverde and his team. When Penn State, the team, played Herschel Walker and the University of Georgia, Penn State, the team, beat Herschel and the University of Georgia. They win as a team. Now you might say, but what happens to the individuals? Do they sacrifice their careers in order to become team players? Penn State University has the third largest number of active players in the National Football League of any college in America today. Now why would that be? The pro scouts and the pro teams prefer the outstanding talent who can function as a member of a team more than they do just the star who is not as team-oriented. By putting the team first, they end up first, is what I'm saying. It's still true. You can have everything in life you want if you'll just help enough other people get what they want. You reach your goals by becoming a team player. If you're married, ideally, if you and your mate get together and go over your plans and work together, then the chances individually of you reaching your goals are enhanced. U.S. News and World Report, January 13, 1986, reported on the one million millionaires in America today. Discovered something intriguing. They discovered, for example, that considerably less than 1% of all of the millionaires in America earn their money in entertainment, television, music, athletics, radio, all combined, considerably less than 1%. The typical millionaire has been working 20 to 30 years supplying basic human needs in life, and the typical millionaire is still married to the high school or college sweetheart. Team is what I'm saying. Step number 12, in order to reach your goals, you've got to know how to train fleas. I know you heard the one about the two fleas at the bottom of the hill, and one of them said, well, do we walk or take a dog? <laughs> you know, I guess that's a little corny. Anyhow, you train fleas by putting them in a jar. And you put the top on the jar, and those fleas will jump up, and they'll hit that top over and over and over and over and over and over and over. You watch them jump for a while, and then all of a sudden you'll notice that though they're continuing to jump, they will no longer be hitting the top. Then it's an absolute fact you can take the top off. The fleas will continue to jump, but they will not jump out because they cannot jump out. And they cannot jump out because they have conditioned themselves to jump just so high. And once they've conditioned themselves to jump just so high, that's all there is. There ain't no more. Man is exactly the same way. He starts out in life to climb the mountain, to write the book, to break the record. Along the way, he bumps his head, he stubs his toe, and he becomes what we call a SNIOP. A SNIOP is spelled S-N-I-O-P, and that's a person who is susceptible to the negative influence of other people. Classic example is the four-minute mile. 
For years, athletes had said, I'm going to break the barrier. I'm going to run it in four minutes or less. They would tow the line and get ready to go. But even as they were towing the line, they knew they'd never break it because the coach's voice would come back to them. Four minute mile, man, you'll never break it. You might do it in 402, maybe even 401, but nobody will ever break the four minute barrier. The words of the doctor would come back. A four minute mile, the human body cannot stand it. Your heart will come right out of there. You cannot run a four minute mile. Nobody did until a flea trainer named Roger Bannister came along. Now, first of all, Roger Bannister was a superb athlete. Second, he had a tremendous positive mental attitude. Third, he was a gold setter personified. He measured his strides. He had broken it down to that degree. He had timed himself for the quarter mile, the half mile, the three quarters, and so forth. He had gotten himself in peak condition. He was a team player. He got three other guys to serve as pacers with him. The last one was Chris Chataway, who paced him that last one-fourth of a mile. The plans were set, and he ran that mile in a little less than four minutes. One of the classic pictures of all time shows Roger Bannister crossing the line as Landy of Australia, who had been in the lead, had turned around looking on this side to see where Bannister was, he goes sweeping by on the other side. A lot of lessons in that. Number one, the difference between winning and being second is very small. Number two, it's not a very good idea to be looking back when you ought to be looking ahead. Now, since Bannister broke the barrier, there have been over a thousand races run in less than four minutes. Eight guys on at least five different occasions in the same race have run a mile in less than four minutes. John Walker of Australia was running his 100th sub four-minute mile when we were in New Zealand three years ago on an earlier trip over there. He has now run, I believe, 119 sub four-minute miles. One fellow, 37 years old, has run a four-minute mile. Now, the reason they can do it is because Bannister set the way. When he broke the barrier, he proved that it was not a physical impossibility. It was a psychological barrier which has been broken. You see, a flea trainer is a person who's driven from within. A flea trainer is not influenced by the negatives of life. He is not a snot. He's driven internally. He jumps out of the jar. A flea trainer understands that you can have everything in life you want if you'll just help enough other people get what they want. Flea trainers don't tell other people where to get off. They show them how to get on. Flea trainers don't try to see through people. Flea trainers see people through. Want to reach your goals? You must know how to train fleas. Step number 13, you need to see the reaching. You need to see yourself as already being and achieving your objective. I literally, as I said earlier, put that fellow in the jockey shorts, pasted him on my bathroom mirror, and I saw myself as being that kind of an individual at that weight. You need to see yourself in your new home. You need to see yourself and your wife or your husband enjoying the relationship that you had dreamed of enjoying earlier when you were courting. You need to see your children growing up successfully in your mind to be the kind of kids you want them to be. The basketball player who is successful literally sees that ball going through the net before he ever turns it loose. Jack Nicholas said he got his best practice in on the golf course before he got to the golf course. Flying his plane, getting there, he mentally played every hole. He saw that ball split in the middle of the fairway. He saw that ball landing gently on the green. He saw that putt going in the hole. We literally need to see the reaching. Many years ago, a young sailor was at sea. It was during the days of the sailing ships. A squall came up. He was ordered aloft to trim the sails. He made the mistake of looking down. And the turbulence of the sea combined with the roll of the ship caused him to become nauseated and he started to lose his balance. 
An older sailor underneath shouted up, Look up, son, look up. The young sailor looked up and immediately regained his balance. The message is very clear. When the outlook isn't good, and it often isn't, try the uplook. It's always good. Helen Keller expressed it so eloquently when she said that if you're looking at the sun, you will seldom see any shadows. You need to see the reaching. And then as you reach any goal, you need to immediately set a new one. Uh, I want to tell you that I fervently believe that the suggestions we have made in this series will make a dramatic difference. I want to say to you that I have not told you to do one single thing, not one single thing, that I have not done myself. When I had the dream of becoming a speaker, I visualized all of these things taking place. I saw in my imagination doing everything that we've been talking about. I saw myself on platform. I saw the audiences sitting there in wild-eyed astonishment that mere mortal could utter such incredible words of wisdom. In these speeches I made in my mind, when I would tell a joke, the audience wouldn't just laugh, they'd get in the aisles and roll up and down the stairs on occasion. When I finished, I got a spontaneous 10-minute standing ovation. It was phenomenal. Now, the beautiful thing about the imagination, you can let it run absolutely wild. But let me encourage you, be very careful about following the exact directions that I've been giving. Be very careful about seeing the reaching and using your imagination in this way. Be absolutely certain that you really do want to accomplish those objectives. Because folks, if you do, it works. I can tell you, it works. These things are down to earth. They are practical on a daily basis. You buy these ideas. You follow these procedures. You do these things. Because if you do, I can truly close by saying, I'll see you. And yes, I definitely do mean you at the top. Thank you so much. A number of years ago, before it was too dangerous to do so, I would occasionally pick up a hitchhiker. And I picked up this young fellow one day. I was on my way down to Pensacola for an engagement. At one time in my life, I felt a moral responsibility to try to enthuse, inspire, motivate, invigorate, educate every human being I came in touch with. Well, I've obviously got a captive audience in this particular instance. The young man could not go anywhere. He was tied down. There he was. And so as we chatted along, you know, and I started espousing my philosophy of life and how wonderful things were, you know, and finally I finished my little dissertation. It didn't take me nearly as long uh, in those days as it does now. And I got through and I said, well, uh, son, let me ask you. I've been doing all the talking. I said, how would you like to make a lot of money and be really successful in life? He got that far away look in his eyes and a wistful expression came on his face as he said, oh, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> well, now, that's not exactly what I had in mind. I mean, now, that's not the way I would describe an overwhelming desire for being successful. You can check the records, you'll find that great teachers, brilliant musicians, outstanding athletes, marvelous parents, unusually effective government leaders, all of them have had a tremendous desire to be successful in whatever it is they're doing. Whether it's to be the best household executive, the best parrot, or the best banker, it requires a considerable amount of desire in order to get there. 
1986 Harvard study revealed that the outstanding people have one thing in common, and that is an absolute sense of mission. They don't go to work every day. They go on a mission. They have something they really want to do. I believe that desire is the great equalizer. You know, in the old west, they used to have the six shooters, and that way the little feller could handle the big feller, and that was their equalizer. In today's world, I believe that the equalizer is desire. If we use enough of it, and if we have enough of it, it will enable us to change the hot water of mediocrity to the steam of outstanding success. You know, little things do make a big difference. You take 211 degrees and you've got really hot water. You can take that hot water and you can make a cup of coffee with it or a cup of hot tea or you can shave with it. But if you add one more degree and then that hot water converts to steam, you can take that steam and propel a locomotive literally all over the country. Or you can take a steamship and propel it all the way around the world. It's the other degree that makes the difference. Most salespeople will tell you there is absolutely no commission on the sale they almost make. How many of you are salespeople and would agree with that? There's not much excitement in uh, almost sinking the putt or almost getting a hit or almost anything. But the difference between doing it and not doing it many times is measured just in minute amounts. When I think of desire, I think of a baseball player who back in 1946 played for the St. Louis Browns. Now, the St. Louis Browns were arguably the weakest major league team to ever take the field. Uh, their one loss record was uh, three shades worse than pathetic. Uh, this baseball player they had uh, only lasted uh, one year. He was an outfielder. He was not even a regular. He never got a home run. And yet I believe that for my money, he's got to qualify as a legitimate candidate for the Hall of Fame. The young man's name was Pete Gray. And as a young man, he'd had a burning desire, an absolutely overwhelming ambition, and that ambition was to play Major League Ball. And he did it despite the fact that he only had one arm. But that one arm, coupled with a tremendous desire, enabled him to get all the way to the major leagues. So many times it is the thing that does make the difference. I have a friend and an outstanding speaker from Charlotte, North Carolina. His name is Ty Boyd. And Ty often says that you take the hands you're dealt and utilize it to the best of your ability. And with that combination, you are going to, in fact, be successful in many, many fields of endeavor. Now, a lot of people complain today about not having enough talent to do the job. How many times have you heard somebody say, boy, if I could whistle like that fella or sing like that fella, if I could recruit like that one or sell like that one or handle objections like that one or manage like that one, what they often are saying is if I just had somebody else's ability, what wouldn't I do? The answer is not a cotton-picking thing. With somebody else's ability, if you're not using the ability which you have. One of the best-known parables is the story of the talents. It seems that the uh, Lord was going away into a far country, so he called three of his servants in, and he gave one of them five talents, he gave one of them two talents, and he gave the third one one talent. He says, now, I'm going to be going away into the far country. When I come back, I will expect a report on what you do. Well, when he came back, he called the one he'd given five talents to, and he said, well, how'd you do? And he said, well, Lord, he said, I really did good. I took these five talents, I put them to work, and now I've got ten. The Lord said, well done, thou good and faithful servant, because you've been faithful in few, I will give you many. And so he gave him more talents. And then he said some exciting words. He says, enter ye into the joy of the Lord. He went to the second one and said, how'd you do? And he said, well, I did good. He said, I had the two talents. I put them to work. Now I got four. He says, you did do good. And he told him the same thing. He went to the one who had the one talent. And he said, well, how'd you do? And now, you know, we're going to get a different answer, aren't we? Now we encounter one of the crybabies of life. Those who always say, you know, if I'd have just had more, I'd have used what I had. 
And he said those prophetic words, you know, Lord, I knew that you were a hard and cruel master, that you reaped where you did not sow. And I knew that you were unfair and unjust. And so I took the one talent you gave me and I buried it. And here it is. Then what the Lord said were the hardest words you will find in that portion of the Bible. Thou wicked and slothful servant. And he took the one talent away from him. Now you understand that what I'm now going to say is pure conjecture. I have no reason whatever for believing uh, this. And yet it just seems to me that it is consistent with everything I know about life. I believe it had to do taking the one talent and tried to do something with it. That even had he lost it, I believe he would have been given another chance. I really believe that. But because he did not use it, then it too was taken away from him. The law says very clearly that if we use what we've got, we will be given more to use. When we were doing our section on goals, I talked a great deal about the fact that we identify a lot of things that we think we want. We write them all down. Now, I said it might work out that you don't want to work on those right now, but don't eliminate those from the list because later as you grow and mature and develop, then they will become legitimate goals at some other area of your life. When we grow, we can do so many more things with the talent which we have. Newt Rockney, the famous football coach at Notre Dame, had a statement. He said, I don't like to lose... And that isn't so much because it's just a football game, but because the defeat means the failure to reach an objective. I think that's a pretty good uh, way of looking at it. When you use what you've got, when you have that desire, the chances of winning, though, are much, much greater. Rockney pointed out that a lot of people thought they had to be the good losers or bad winners. He felt this was a lousy choice. He also pointed out that he had no desire to get enough experience at losing to be a good one. <laughs> show me a good loser, he said, and I'll show you a loser. <laughs> give me 11 lousy losers and I'll give you a national championship football team. He said the way a man wins shows much of his character and the way he loses shows all of it. However, I'm speaking about the will, determination, and the desire to win. We simply don't have to make the choice between being good losers and bad winners. We can be good winners, and the more experience we have at winning, then the better we can become or get at being good winners. When I think of desire, I think of a man named Ben Hogan. Now, I'm a golf bug or a golf fanatic. There are a lot of people who play the game better than I do. There really are, as you would undoubtedly know. But I don't believe there's a human being alive who enjoys the game anymore. I just love to get out there and tee that little dude up. I, I run a temperature when I get close to the golf course. I really do. So when I start talking about golfers, I start talking about Ben Hogan who might well be the greatest player who ever played the game when you consider everything. He started on a financial shoestring, literally had to eat almost nothing and survive in the cheapest places to survive the tour. And then just as he was reaching his peak, one night he and his wife Valerie were on their way to another tournament. It was very, very foggy. And as they rounded a curve, he saw the oncoming headlights of a Greyhound bus. He instinctively and instantaneously threw himself over in front of his wife, and that move probably saved both of their lives uh, because his steering wheel was jammed all the way back through the seat where he was. The doctors, and there were many of them, were unanimous in their agreement on one thing, and that is that Ben Hogan would be a very, very fortunate man to ever get out of his bed. They all knew he'd never be able to walk, and as far as him ever playing the game again, it would be out of the question. There was no way. But they simply had not reckoned with the steel will 
the tremendous drive, the outstanding desire that Ben Hogan had. And even as he lay there in the hospital bed, uh, he had those golf clubs in his hands. And he kept feeling those clubs and visualizing those clubs. And he started doing exercises to strengthen his hands. When he started walking again, he could just barely, with the aid of uh, canes and crutches, just barely move around. But he would stand there in his room, and he would take his putter, and he would start putting. Uh, he would go out to the course on crutches, and he would stand there, and he would swing, just standing there, swing a club, and swing a club, and swing a club. And gradually, over the months, he got stronger and stronger, and of course, the rest of his story story is absolute history. He won those tournaments. He set some records. He did some things that were absolutely impossible. Ben Hogan was not what you might call the natural golfer. His was a talent that was there. There's no denying he had some, but there were many golfers who had infinitely more. But nobody had any more desire to make it than Ben Hogan did. Now, lest we misunderstand, a lot of times, you know, we kind of get carried away and I have a natural tendency to do that. My enthusiasm sometimes, you know, gets the best of them. And enthusiasm is kind of like running in the dark. You know, you might get there, but you might get killed on the way. <laughs> so enthusiasm uh, sometimes has to be tempered with direction, and I try to do that. Because sometimes people get the impression that all you've got to do is have the desire, and then you can do just about anything. And that oftentimes is not quite the case. In the 1988 Olympics in Calgary, Canada, I think all of us who have any interest in sports are aware of the fact there was a young man named Dan Jansen who was our speed skater. He was favored to win a gold medal. Surely 90% of the people in the world, with the exception of those who were competing directly with him, whose country was competing directly with him, with that exception, I believe everybody else in the world was pulling for Dan Jansen. That very morning, his older sister had died of a leukemia. His desire to win that medal was absolutely overwhelming. He had trained faithfully. He was favored to win. And yet on the very first turn, as one of those quirks of fate happened, uh, his skates flew out from under him, and he goes crashing in the wall, and he ends up being out of the race before it even got started. It took a tremendous amount of desire to get him where he was. Well, let me say that what happens now, his desire to do something with that accident is going to be a determining factor in what he really does with the rest of his life. How will he handle that one? Is the same desire going to be there? And I'm not necessarily talking about him preparing another four years to be a skating champion again, but I'm talking about what's he going to do with his life? See, each one of us in our lifetime have faced some serious disappointments and some defeats and some setbacks. We're going to face them again in our life. And so what we're going to have to do is learn how to handle those situations like that. But again, let me say that desire creates what we call intelligent ignorance. And if you've got some real intelligent ignorance, then a lot of things can happen. For example, in the world of sales, we have seen this happen where a brand new salesperson comes in. This individual really does not understand all of the fine techniques of selling, but they're so gung-ho on their product and they're really enthusiastic about it. They believe it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, and they just believe that for them this represents a tremendous opportunity. They believe everybody alive ought to have this fantastic product, and the net result is they go out and sell rings around the old established pros. How many of you have seen that happen time and time again? Desire does make a difference in many occasions. Desire also has manifested itself a lot of times in basketball games and football games where you've had the players out there a few minutes and then the coach blows the whistle or the ref blows the whistle and the coach said substitution and off comes a fresh body off the bench, you know. Here's a second stringer, but here's one who wants to really impress the coach and the crowd, you know, and he figures, well, if I'm going to get out there and I'm really going to show him a thing or two and who knows, maybe I will be starting the next game. And I have seen the substitute 
in many, many occasions actually perform better than the starting player. They have that little extra little bit in there that makes a difference. The bumblebee, I believe, is the classic example of what intelligent ignorance is really all about. If you've done any reading and studying about aerodynamics, you know that the bumblebee cannot fly. His body is too heavy. His wings are too light. We read very carefully and clearly that it is impossible for him to fly. But you see, the bumblebee doesn't read. The bumblebee flies. Henry Ford was a classic case of a man who had what we call intelligent ignorance. He was a man with a limited education. Uh, he had made a fortune with the uh, old Model T and then the Model A. And then one day he had a wild idea. I mean weird and way out. He conceived an idea of building a V8 engine. Now, Mr. Ford was not an engineer. So he called his high-priced staff together and he said, Gentlemen, I want you to build for me a V8 engine. Well, they tried to humor the old man a little bit. You know, they didn't want to put him down too hard, but they gently explained to him that uh, the V8 was an engineering impossibility. And he said, well, I understand that, but we've got to have one, and I want you to build it, and I want you to go do it right now. Well, they made a half-hearted effort. They spent quite a few dollars. They came back a few months later and said, well, Mr. Ford, just like we said, the V8 engine is an impossibility. It cannot be done. He said, gentlemen, obviously you don't understand. We've got to have a V8 engine, and you're going to build one. Now go build it. Well, this time they went out, and they spent a little more money. They stayed a little bit longer. And finally, uh, they came back and said, Mr. Ford, it just can't be done. Well, this time, Mr. Ford really hit the ceiling. I mean, he blew his stack. He said, gentlemen, apparently I'm not communicating my message to you. The V8 engine is going to be built, and you're going to build it for me, and I want you to go out there this time, and I don't want you to come back until you tell me the news we've got to have. You are, in fact, going to build a V8 engine. They built the V8 engine. One man had that intelligent ignorance, and that really is what happened. Henry Ford once said, I'm looking for a lot of men with an infinite capacity for not knowing what can't be done. That's what all of us need in every company in America. We need more people who don't know what can't be done, and they're the ones who will go out there and do it. I love what our Mrs. Mamie McCullough, the I Can lady, says. She's the one who's taken the book, See You at the Top, and converted it to a course which is being taught all over the country. She, in teaching her first class down in the little town of Thomasville, Georgia, thought of this one day and has had a tremendous amount of fun with it. And the nice thing about it is it makes a lot of sense. First day, she said to the class, I want you to describe for me and I can't. She asked them to describe it to the very best of uh, their ability. What does a can't look like? And they wrestled with that a moment or two and said, well, Mr. McCullough, we don't know what a can't looks like. She said, I don't either. She said, now I would like for you to describe for me a can. And they started describing cans, you know, big cans, little cans, or round cans, square cans, long cans, short cans, I mean, all kind of cans. She said, in other words, there's no such thing as a can. You can't see it and smell it and taste it and feel it or touch it, but you can smell, feel, taste, touch, can. So I can't doesn't exist, but I can does. We're going to call this the I can course. And I believe that that is what we need more spirit-like in this country of ours, the I can in the spirit. See, if you take intelligent ignorance and lemon and you end up with lemonade. During World War II, General Creighton Abrams, during the Battle of the Bulge, was completely surrounded uh, by the enemy forces. They were north, south, east, and west. His staff officers came to him in a panic and said, General Abrams, we're completely surrounded. And he, in essence, said, well, that's magnificent. Let's let the troops know that for the first time in the history of this entire campaign, we can now attack the enemy in any direction we choose. <laughs> It's not what the situation is, it is what we make of the situation we're in. Uh, we just need to remember that the darkest night since the beginning of time did not turn out all the stars. And that on the brightest day, you can go down into a well and you can see the stars only from the dark spot. Sometimes when things look their very darkest, it is only at that darkest moment 
that we can, from the well, see the gleam of light that is going to lead us to where we really want to go. But we've got to have that desire in order to do that. If you take a lemon and add desire to it, that's where you get the lemonade. Charles Kettering, for example, had a lemon. I don't know if there's anybody who's listening to this recording who's old enough to know this, but years and years ago, they used to have cranks on automobiles. How many of you in the live audience ever used an old crank to start an automobile? Well, for the benefit of those who don't know what I'm talking about, it's at the front of the automobile and you stand down there and you turn that sucker and that's the way you get that engine started. Well, uh, Charles Kettering was out there cranking his car one day and it kicked him. Now, there's some mechanical procedures that you go through to explain what happens when the car kicks you, but I had a mechanical bypass when I was a child, so I don't understand quite what all of that is. All I know is that uh, the car will lurch forward, and that's what happened to Kettering, and it broke his arm. Well, obviously, he was in pain. He grabbed his arm, and uh, no sooner had it happened than he got to thinking to himself, you know, as long as we have this problem, the automobile never will be very popular. And it was that broken arm that led him to discover the self-starter, to invent the self-starter. You see, his lemon was a broken arm. His lemonade was the self-starter. Jacob Schick had a lemon. He was prospecting for gold up in Alaska, and he wanted to shave. But at 40 degrees below zero, by the time you poured the water in the uh, pan there, it was too cold to shave. So he invented the electric razor. Neil Jeffrey was a third-string freshman quarterback down at Baylor University, and he went to the coach one day, Coach Grant Taff, and said, I want to be the starting quarterback. The problem with Neil was he stuttered. Now, I don't know what you know about playing quarterback, but that's a position that really, uh, really re does require very fluid speech. I mean, so that you can say what you want to say. You know, there's a second clock up there that you only take so many seconds to get those plays off. And with a lot of stuttering going on, you're going to be called for delay of game about half the time. Well, Neil Jeffrey was an unusual young man. And as I say, he was third string quarterback on the freshman team. But he went to Coach Grant Taff at Baylor, and he said, I want to be the starting quarterback. In 1974, not only was he the starting quarterback, but he led Baylor to its first conference championship in over 50 years and was the most valuable player in the Southwest Conference that year, leading his team into the Cotton Bowl. A lot of times when things happen, we can capitalize on them. If you were to go down to uh, Enterprise, Alabama, uh, there is an unusual statue in the uh, town square. It's a statue to the boll weevil. Now, the reason they erected the statue to the boll weevil is very simple. At one time in that part of the country, cotton was king. It was the only crop they raised. The economy rose and fell on king cotton. And many times people suffered as a direct result of it. There was no diversification. And there's one particular year, the boll weevil just ran wild in that part of the country. I mean, that sucker ate every bite of cotton that was within 40 miles of Enterprise, Alabama. The farmers absolutely suffered a total, complete loss. And as a result of that, they recognized at long last what they'd been told for many years, and that is that they needed to diversify. And so they started raising peanuts and soybeans and corn and many, many other crops. And the economy was so much better that they thought it would be appropriate if they erected this statue right there in the center of town to the bow weevil because the bow weevil is the one who had forced the issue. 
many times when things happen to us, if we will look at what has happened, we can determine that maybe that is the best thing that has ever happened to us after all. Charles Goodyear's lemon, for example, was a prison sentence. He was sent to prison because he wouldn't pay a certain bill. And while he was there, he had the time and privacy to work on his process for vulcanizing rubber. And that's exactly what he did and perfected the process while he was in prison. Martin Luther, while he was confined to Wartburg Castle, gave us the German translation of the Bible. John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress when he was in prison. Gene Tunney became the heavyweight boxing champion of the world because he broke both of his hands. Now, that might sound like a very unusual statement, but when Tunney was a young fighter, he was fighting with the American Expeditionary Forces during World War II over in France. He broke his right hand, and then later he broke his left hand. His trainer and the doctor said, Gene, you simply are never going to be able to make it to become the heavyweight champion of the world because your hands simply are too brittle. They will not stand up under all of this heavy punching that's required to be the heavyweight champion of the world. But Gene Tunney had a tremendous desire to become the heavyweight champion. He said, I will become the most scientific boxer to ever get in the ring. I will box my way into the heavyweight championship. Well, all of us know, of course, that he did win the heavyweight boxing championship from uh, Jack Dempsey, that he did retire as the undefeated heavyweight champion of the world. But ring experts are virtually unanimous in agreement when they say that had he not broken his hands, he never would have been the heavyweight champion because undoubtedly he would have attempted to slug it out with Dempsey, would not have learned the boxing skills, and the smart money of that day said that no man alive could stand up to Jack Dempsey in a toe-to-toe -to -toe slugging battle. He won the championship because he had the desire, because he broke his hands, and because he took that lemon, and out of it he made the lemonade. I'm trying to deliver the same message in a hundred different ways, and that simply is that when adversity strikes, maybe that adversity is what you need in order to become successful. If we have enough desire, it certainly will make a difference. When John Kish of Houston, Texas lost his sense of hearing, Many people thought that because he was a stockbroker, a salesperson, if you will, that his career as a salesperson was over. But John Kish was not one to give up. So he did a lot of maneuvering. He is able to handle telephone calls now via three-way hookups with somebody else there interpreting kind of with the hands as he goes along. He handles personal interviews, and in the last three years, he's grossed over a million dollars annually as a senior vice president in Oppenheimer's regional office down in uh, Houston, Texas. I almost don't care what uh, the situation is, if we add enough desire to it, then some things can happen that will make a difference. Now I'd like to share with you what I believe is the ultimate story as far as teaching is concerned. If you'll notice, I use an awful lot of examples, an awful lot of uh, illustrations in order to cover certain points. The reason I do it is because people remember stories. They remember examples. And if you remember the story or remember the example, then it's easy to extract the lesson from that particular example. This particular story is one that I have been telling now for 23 years. And I tell this story because it involves virtually every principle in which I believe. It really covers the waterfront. In early 1965, I was in Kansas City where I was addressing my first really major seminar. When the seminar was over, I headed back to my room expecting to have a lonely dinner that evening. But as I stepped off the elevator, the booming voice of a man I've come to know and love as a brother sounded out, Zig, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm going to dinner. He said, wait a minute. He said, I'll go with you. It was Bernie Lofchik from Winnipeg, Canada. When we sat down, you have seen it happen where men just become instant, instant friends. And I don't mean just buddies. I mean really close friends. 
We had about the same size families. His daddy died when he was very young. My daddy died when I was very young. Uh, he'd gone to work very early. I'd gone to work very early. He had gotten in the cookware business. I'd gotten in the cookware business. I mean, it was uh, just an amazing thing. We sat down for dinner, and I said, Bernie, you've certainly come a long way to a sales meeting. He said, yeah, you know, it really was magnificent. I got some wonderful ideas, said it really was a great experience. Well, I kind of persisted, you know, I was going to find something negative to say there. So I said, yeah, but it sure cost you a lot of money to come from Winnipeg, Canada, down to Kansas City for a couple of days. Well, he said, you know, Zig, thanks to my son, David, I don't really have to worry about money. I said, Bernie, that sounds like a story. Would you share it with me? He said, yes, I will. He said, when our son David was born, our joy literally knew no bounds. We were related. We already had our two girls. Now we had the boy. That's the family we wanted when we got married. But he said, it wasn't but a few days before we realized something was wrong. David's head hung too limply to the right side of his body. He drooled too much to be a normally healthy baby. But the doctor said, don't worry about it, he'll outgrow it. But you know, Zig, Bernie said, when it's your baby, you worry about it. We took him to a specialist, and the specialist, this was after about six months, the specialist, incredibly enough, diagnosed him with a condition he identified as the reverse of club's feet and treated him for that for several weeks. But Bernie said, you know, Zig, we knew it was more serious than that. So we went to another specialist. And this specialist, after a very exhaustive examination, told us, said, this little boy is a spastic. He has cerebral palsy. He's never going to be able to walk or talk or count to 10. I'm going to suggest that you put him in an institution for his own good and for the good of the, quote, normal members of the family. But Bernie looked at me and with those dark eyes of his flashing, he said, Zig, but he said, you know, I'm not a buyer. I'm a seller. I could not conceive of my son living the life of a vegetable and growing up to be absolutely a nothing. I saw him in a different light altogether. So I asked the doctor if he knew of any other doctors and all this specialist got highly indignant. He stood up. He said, I've given you the best advice you'll ever get. I suggest that you take it. And the interview was over. Bernie Lostick didn't take it. He went to another specialist who told him the same thing. And then another and another and another and yet another. Thirty different specialists said there is no hope for this little boy. Then they heard of a Dr. Pearlstein from Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Pearlstein was reputedly the number one authority in the world on cerebral palsy. But he was so busy that he was booked for two full years in advance. Bernie finally got his home phone, called him there, made an arrangement so that if there was a cancellation, uh, that David would have the first alternate. Just 11 days later, a little boy from Australia canceled, and they bundled David up, flew him to Chicago for the examination. It was probably the most comprehensive physical that any child has been given up until that point. I mean, they really spent hour after hour after hour going over the baby. They threw out all of the other findings, all of the other x-rays. They just started from ground zero and went on with the examination. They called in the best expert in the world to read the x-rays, just to tell them what was there, to make no diagnosis, to make no recommendations, just tell me what you see in the x-ray. When it was all over, Dr. Pearlstein and his nurses sat down with the Lopsics, and they said, this little boy is a spastic. He has cerebral palsy. He's never going to be able to walk or talk or count to 10. If you listen to the prophets of doom. But he said, I happen to be solution conscious, not problem conscious. I believe there's something which you can do for this little boy if you are willing to do your part. The life six rather obviously said, well, doctor, you tell us we will do anything that is humanly possible. Now, at that time, they could not easily afford a very heavy financial burden. But they said, spell it out, doctor, and we'll do what is necessary. And in minute detail, he said, you're going to have to work this little boy beyond all human endurance. Then you're going to have to work him some more. You will have to push him until he literally falls. And then you're going to have to pick him up. And you'll have to push him some more. 
You're going to have to be patience personified because there will be many, many months where you will be unable to detect any progress at all. But if you ever stop, he will go all the way back and then you will have to start all over. You're going to have to understand this is a lifetime commitment you're making, not something you do this year, next year, five years, or whatever. This is from now on. Well, the Lopsicks took David and they went home. They hired a physical fitness expert and a bodybuilder. They built a little gymnasium in the basement of their home and they went to work. It took a number of months before David could even move the length of his own body. One day, many months, probably about two to three years later, Bernie received a call from the therapist. He said, I believe David is ready. Come on home. Bernie Leipzig rushed home. David was down in the gymnasium on a mat getting ready to do a push-up. And as that little body started to rise into the air, the physical and emotional exertion was so great, there was not a dry inch of skin on that little body. The mat looked as if you had sprinkled water on it. When that one perfect push-up was complete, mom and dad, the two sisters, David, the therapist, and several of the neighbors who were over there broke down and shed the tears which clearly say that happiness is not pleasure. Happiness is victory. The story is even more remarkable when we learn that one of America's leading universities had also examined David very carefully and discovered that there were no motor connections to the right side of his body. They had said to him, he has no sense of balance. He will never be able to swim or to skate or to ride a bicycle. On October the 23rd, 1971, my wife and I were in Winnipeg, Canada to see little David Lofchik at his bar mitzvah. I wish you could have been there. I wish the television cameras of the world could have been there to see what we saw. That young boy, 13 years old, whom the doctors had said would never be able to walk or talk or count to 10, at that point in his life had already done as many as 1,100 push-ups in a single day, had run six miles nonstop, was doing extremely well as a seventh grader in ninth grade math at St. John's Ravens Court School for Boys. He was running the wheels off his third bicycle, was skating on the neighborhood hockey team, was one of the best table tennis players in the city of Winnipeg, Canada. The next year, to the best of my knowledge, he became the first, and so far as we know, the only victim of cerebral palsy to qualify for an unrated, ordinary $100,000 life insurance policy. The reason I share with you so many of the details of David's story is because it involves the principles that we've been talking about all the way through. First of all, there was the foundation which is solid. They were absolutely honest with the Lofchicks and the Lofchicks in turn were honest with David. Character is, as Calvert Roberts says, the ability to carry out a good resolution long after the excitement of the moment has passed. It's one thing to agree with the doctor, you're going to do this for the next 15 years. It's another thing to do it for the next 15 years. Integrity, no question, all the way from day one. Loyalty, you've never seen a family that were so one as the Lofchick family is. Trust. Don't you know that the trust had to be incredible? Three hours every single day from then on in, David had to be in there working. Don't you know that when the doctor said there'll be years and years when you won't be able to see any change, that involved an incredible amount of trust. How many of us, for example, would have been willing to have hung in there all of that length of time? Love? One of the most beautiful love stories I think I've ever heard is this one. When David was about two years old, they had to start putting heavy leg braces on his legs every evening. And they had to make them progressively tighter. And every evening when Bernie and or Elaine would put those leg braces on, 
David would be there literally with tears in his eyes, and he had beautiful green eyes. He was a beautiful child, cold black hair, olive complexion, with tears in his eyes saying, Mommy, do we have to put him on tonight? Or Daddy, do you have to make him so tight? Now, don't you know that any mother or father in existence would really have had trouble with that one? Uh, but Bernie and Elaine Lofchick loved David so much, they said no to the tears of the moment <coughs> so they could say yes to the laughter of a lifetime. See, when you really love someone, you do for that person what is best for that person. Attitude every night when they were putting uh, David to bed. Uh, first Elaine and then later Bernie. When he would come in every night, he would awaken David and he'd hold him in his arms. He'd say, son, you're a champ. You can do anything you want to do, son. And dad really loves you and mom really loves you. He was one of the first people to get a cassette recorder. In those days, they were just coming out. And every day while he was taking his therapy, he would be listening to the motivation while he was taking the therapy. Self-image, obviously, as a child, he could not have a good one as an infant, but today, of course, he does. Relationships, probably nobody has ever worked as closely with and in better cooperation with others than David Lofchick has been working all of his life. Goals, we talk about daily goals and long-range goals and big goals. David Lofchick had literally hourly goals on many occasions. Nobody has ever worked them any harder than David Lofchick. Desire, when you start talking about desire, you're talking about a youngster who surpasses just about anybody and anything I've ever seen. The physical effort that went in all of this is absolutely astronomical. And David Lofchick, for one solid year, set his opportunity clock one hour earlier than any other member of the family. And when that clock would sound off, he'd get up and put his skates on, go out to that frozen swimming pool, and it took him one solid winter just to learn how to stand up on the ice. Later, he skated on the neighborhood hockey team. You've heard it said many times throughout the series that you can have everything in life you want if you'll just help enough other people get what they want. One of the interesting phenomena of this is that Bernie and Elaine Lofchick, in the process of providing David his opportunity in life, Bernie not only had to work smarter, but he also had to work harder. For seven years, Bernie Lofchick worked seven days and seven nights every week. He took off one Friday night in seven years in order to provide the financial necessities for giving his son everything he needed. Today, Bernie Lofchick is an extraordinarily wealthy man. But it goes beyond that. You see, they embrace the free enterprise system. But what effect does this have on other people? Let me share with you one of the other little interesting sidelines about the fact that we never really do go through life by ourselves. I was speaking out in Lubbock, Texas here several years ago, and I told David's story. There was a young couple seated in the very front, and as I told the story, they were visibly moved and asked for a visit privately when it was over. We visited and they asked me the name of the doctor who had taken Dr. Pearlstein's place when Dr. Pearlstein retired. I gave them that uh, doctor's name. That little girl, she's 18 months old. They flew her to Chicago for the examination because she had cerebral palsy. The doctor examined this little girl thoroughly. And when he finished the examination, he said, this little girl does not have cerebral palsy. She simply was born prematurely. She's a little slow developing her. She's been misdiagnosed. But because you have been treating her as if she had cerebral palsy, she has acquired some of the symptoms of the disease. Take her back and treat her as a normal, healthy little girl, and you will end up having the normal, healthy little girl that you really want to have. It's quite a story, the David Lofstick story. It involves an awful lot of principles. It's not easy, but I think you'll agree 
that it's a story that we can learn from. Many, many times over the course of the years, I have thought to myself, I wonder how much bigger and faster and stronger and smarter, I wonder how much more David Lofchick would have been had he been given the same chance in life that you and I were given. And finally one day, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Had he been given more, he undoubtedly would have ended up with less, maybe a whole lot less. Maybe that's the reason God tells us in his book to thank him for everything. Well, what's the end of the story? Well, the story's not ended. That's the reason we can't really end it, but I can bring you up to date. David Lofstick today is a handsome young man of 29 years of age. 195 pounds, a barrel for a chest. Happily married, a proud papa. And for the last two years, he's been the number one condominium salesman in the number one real estate firm in Winnipeg, Canada, having a marvelous time and a marvelous career. The principles he learned as a child are standing him in good stead now and will for the rest of his life. You see, it's not the story I'm really talking about. It's the principles that we're talking about. When you apply these principles, do these things and follow through on them, I can close as I always do by saying, if you'll do that, then I'll see you. And yes, I really do mean you at the top. Thank you. Many years ago, a wise old king called all of his wise men together, and he said, I want you to go out and compile for me the wisdom of the ages. I want you to put it in bound book form so we can leave it to posterity. They went out and they worked a long time. They came back and they had 12 huge volumes, and the wise old king looked at it and he said, well, I'm confident that is the wisdom of the ages, but that's too lengthy, condensed it. People won't read all of that. They came back this time with one huge volume, and again, the wise old king said, still too long, got to condense it. They came back with just a chapter, then a page, then a paragraph, and finally with a sentence. The wise old king looked at the sentence, and he said, now that's it. That is truly the wisdom of the ages. And as soon as all men everywhere learn this, we will have solved many of our problems. The sentence simply said... There ain't no free lunch. <laughs> now, the wise old king literally hit the nail on the head. When men learn that if they want to occupy their places in the sun, they'll have to expect some blisters, then much will have been accomplished. Work is the price we pay to travel the highway of success. We can best guard against losing our shirts by keeping our sleeves rolled up and many people believe success is dependent upon the glands. And of course, they're right if we're talking about sweat glands. America was built by people who worked and pulled on the oars, not by those who rested on the oars. I'm going to be so bold as to suggest that if you'll stop your recording now and turn it back and listen to that again, you'll be well advised to do so. There's a tremendous amount of thinking behind that concept. Somebody once wrote that work is the foundation of all business, the source of all prosperity, and the parent of genius. Work can do more to advance youth than his own parents, be they ever so wealthy. It is represented in the humblest savings and has laid the foundation of every fortune. It is the salt that gives life its savor. But it must be loved before it can bestow its greatest blessings and achieve its greatest ends. When loved, work makes life sweet, purposeful, and fruitful. Since the beginning of time, we've all agreed there ain't no free lunch. 
People in government, education, religion, industry, it doesn't make any difference. They've all agreed there ain't no free lunch. And then for some reason, we decide to legalize horse racing, dog racing, casinos, state lotteries. And no wonder then our kids are confused. One minute we're saying, you got to work, and the other we're saying, now let's gamble our way to prosperity. Well, a wise man observed that the success family has work as the father and integrity as the mother. Now, if you've been following me all the way through, you might long about now be saying, now, wait a minute, Ziegler, daggone, you're fast-talking, cotton-picking hide. You've been leading me all through these sessions, and you've told me that we've got to have a good, solid foundation, and I agree with that. You've got to have goals, and you've got to have a desire. I agree with all of those things. Now, are you telling me after I've done all of that that I've got to work, too? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying you got to do. The most beautiful philosophy in the world won't work if you won't. Education and motivation cover a lot of ground, but they won't cultivate any of it. That just happens to be a fact of life. And work started very early. You know, a lot of people don't realize it. But when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, they weren't there to pick and eat the fruit. They were there to tend the garden. They were put there to work from the very beginning. So we're going to keep on talking about it. We need to start early. We expect our children to accomplish and then give them everything so there's no need to accomplish anything in life. There's an ancient Jewish proverb that says, if you don't teach a man a trade, you raise a thief. I believe there's some validity to that observation. William Bennett, the Secretary of Education in a New York Times article, made this observation. One of the unutterable truths of the education issue is that there is actually no correlation between funds expended on education and educational excellence. In other words, you got to do more than buy an education. Facts are facts. From 1960 to 1985, national expenditures on education have nearly tripled as SAT scores have plummeted. Some of the most expensive school systems in the country have shown themselves to be among the least effective. The nation's parochial systems are cheap by comparison with their public counterparts. But who can doubt that they are more effective, as has been demonstrated time and again? Listen to this. Education depends on motivation and the formation of good work habits. The most precise predictor of educational achievement is neither money nor class size, but the quality of homework assigned and completed. All of this was well established most recently in the Education Department's publication, What Works, Research About Teaching and Learning. That's what they've discovered. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not here to take out after educators or our educational system. So I don't think we've got an educational problem. I think we've got a societal problem. But because that's part of society, we just need to understand that even after we've invested billions of dollars in schools, we're still going to have to work in order to separate the information from the book it's in and put it into the minds of the students. You teach a student early and we learn this lesson ourselves because this next sentence is profound. Now, as you know, I always tell people when I'm about to say something profound. And the reason I do is because I learned many years ago that an incredibly high percentage of my audiences do not recognize my profound statements as being profound <laughs> if I don't tell them in advance. And I just don't want anybody to miss this profound statement, but here it is. You never work for somebody else, never. Now, somebody else might write your check and might sign your check, but the truth is you work for yourself inasmuch as you're the one who will eventually determine 
what the amount they fill in that check is going to be. We need to learn that and we need to teach it. Every job is a self-portrait of the person who did it. Like the portrait painter who signs his name, we should autograph our work with excellence. When you do more than you're paid to do, you will eventually be paid more for what you do. One of the great privileges I had was to learn some important lessons as a child. My mother in the latter stages of her life often said that she deeply regretted that her children had had to work so hard when we were children. Each one of us assured her repeatedly that one of the great benefits we had was the privilege of learning to work early on. And I think we finally persuaded her of that. But I was working in a grocery store there in Yazoo City, Mississippi. During the Depression, literally 90 to 95% of our business was done between about noon on Friday and 11 o'clock on Saturday night. That's when the farmers came in and bought their supplies. And all of the people who lived in town would get paid on Friday, and that's when they had their money. And things were awfully, awfully tight. We would attempt to buy the amount of food, groceries that is, in the store that the boss thought we would sell that week. They just didn't carry much inventory. We often would run out. The stores then would borrow from each other. There's a young fellow named Charlie Scott that worked across the street. He was the runner for that store. I was the runner for our store. Charlie Scott hit that front door of ours, I'll bet you, 10,000 times when I was a child. He'd hit the front door running and he'd say, Mr. Anderson, I need to borrow a half dozen cans of tomatoes. Mr. Anderson, the owner of the store, would say, well, Charlie, you know where they are? Go get them. Old Charlie would be in a dead run. He'd go back there and he'd snatch the six cans of tomatoes off the shelf. He would scoop back up to the counter. He'd plop the tomatoes down. He'd scribble his name on the receipt Mr. Anderson had signed. He'd snatch those tomatoes back up and he'd be off in a dead run. And one day I finally said, Mr. Anderson, how come Charlie Scott's always in such a hurry? Mr. Anderson kind of grinned and said, Charlie's always in a hurry because Charlie working for a raise and he looks like he's going to get it too. I said, Mr. Anderson, how do you know Charlie's going to get a raise? Mr. Anderson kind of grinned. He said, I know Charlie's going to get a raise because if the man he's working for doesn't give it to him, I am. <laughs> it is absolutely true that when you do more than you're paid to do, you will eventually be paid more for what you do. Now, the person you're working for might not do it. But somebody's going to see what you're doing, and they're going to give you the extra that you're going to deserve. It's not pull that makes the difference in life. It really is push that makes the difference. I'm convinced that one of the reasons that we're suffering an import uh, deficit today is because our Japanese counterparts, as an example, are outworking us. Not outperforming us, they're outworking us. As an example, the average Japanese high school graduate has been in the classroom more hours than the average American college graduate. The average Japanese student spends a little over three hours a day outside the classroom studying. The average American student spends a little less than 30 minutes a day outside the classroom studying. Now, you could not persuade me that all of those hundreds of extra hours do not make a difference. It's just a fact. They're certainly no smarter than we are, but they're working harder to accomplish their objectives. I'll give you this as an observation, and please, everybody listening to this recording, please understand now, I'm not talking about your kids when I talk like this, but I am talking about the average kids in America. I just want you to know that when we compare to what's going on. In Japan, you ask the average teenager where he's going to go to university, what company he's going to go to work for, what department he's going to go to work in, what he's going to do, where it'll be five years from today, ten years from today, he can tell you. You ask the average American and he can tell you how much money uh, Michael Jackson got for the Pepsi commercial. 
He can tell you how much money Herschel Walker got when he signed his cowboy contract. He can tell you how many records Bruce Springsteen has sold. And he can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, how many home runs Reggie Jackson has hit. But you talk to him about the world of work. And you're talking about an entirely different situation. They're identifying with the world of play. I don't misunderstand. That's not the kid's fault. Now, I'm not fussing at the kids by any stretch of imagination. I just don't know many kids that own movie studios and television studios and record producing studios and that sort of thing. As I understand it, they're owned mostly by us adults. We need to be the ones who are doing the closing. We need to be the ones who are doing the working and the teaching. Unless your company closes or merges, actually, you should never have to look for but one job. And I think that's the message we ought to teach our kids. And you ought to do that job so enthusiastically and so well that like Charlie Scott, you'll just go on from there. I was in Starkville, Mississippi several years ago at Mississippi State conducting a seminar. I told the Charlie Scott story. When it was, uh, seminar was over, this tall fellow walked up to me and he said, when's the last time you've seen old Charlie? And I said, well, gracious, I left Yazoo City in 1944. He was a couple of years older than I was. He left in 42. I haven't seen him since. He said, you probably wouldn't even recognize him, will you? I said, no, I don't guess he would. He said, well, I didn't think so. He said, I'm Charlie Scott. <laughs> He was a man who was a very wealthy man, according to his friends, retired at age 50 to do exactly what he wanted to do in life. Now, he was able to do that because what he learned as a kid in a grocery store, he applied it all through his work career. He always gave it that extra effort with the expected results. Now, probably the most humiliating thing anybody can do as far as a job is concerned is to lose one that you're overqualified for. And that often happens. You know, you get a job that's absolutely beneath you. I mean, I can go to sleep doing this, and they generally do go to sleep doing it. Now, when you get fired from a job that you're overqualified for, what are you going to tell the next future employer? You got fired from this job. You mean it was putting sand in a bag and you couldn't handle that one? Well, let me tell you something. Whatever the job is, the best way to qualify for the next one is to be super good at this one. A number of years ago, we were at dinner one evening, my wife, my son, and myself, and went to a steakhouse, and we walked in and sat down. And the young bus boy came in, and he was pouring the water for the glasses. He snatched the glass up off the table, and he doused it in. He picked the other one up, and he doused it in. He picked the other one up, and he doused it in. I watched him kind of intently, and the expression on his face was a sight to behold. When he finished the third one, I said, don't like your job, huh? He said, no, I don't. I said, well, don't worry about it. I said, you're not going to have it very long. <laughs> He looked at me in absolute shock, and he said, w what are you talking about? I said, young man, let me tell you something. There's not a company on earth that could afford to have you on the payroll if you were paying them to let you work here. With that attitude, I can guarantee you, you're not going to have this job long. He did an abrupt turn around. He walked through the door, and you've seen the old Abbott and Costello movies. He strode through it like he was mad at the world, and then immediately his other one come back this way. He walked out, I mean, <laughs> it was hilarious, just the biggest grin on his face, and what a dramatic difference it made. Uh, whatever the job is, give it your best. I know all of you know who Michael Landon is. He's had some incredible series, Bonanza. Highway to Heaven, he's starring in now, I believe that's the name of it. And he had another one, Little House on the Prairie. He's recognized. His first job was mixing glue and cutting ribbons in a ribbon factory. Now, how much skill do you need to do that? But Michael Landon said he learned to give that his absolute best. And when he gave it his very best, he said, you know, I got an enormous amount of satisfaction from it. But the way you get out of a job you don't like is you do it so extraordinarily well that nobody can afford to keep you in that position. 
In his book, How to Manage Your Boss, George Berkeley suggests that if you're going to do any extra work, if you really want to get ahead, he suggests that you come in early. That indicates an eagerness to get on with the job, whereas if you stay late, that could mean that uh, you simply could not finish the job. You take enthusiasm to your job and you look for the extra things to get into. Make certain that when you've been with the company 10 years that you've got 10 years experience, not one year's experience 10 times, because that's not the way you get promoted. My friend Steve Brown from Atlanta, who is an outstanding speaker, put it this way. He said, remember that anything worth doing is worth doing poorly until you learn to do it well. You see, a lot of times we are hesitant to tackle something because we are uncertain of our skills. But when the employer or the boss says, I want you to do this, we simply should say, I'll sure give it my best shot. I've never done it before. But that doesn't mean I can't do it. Let me see how I can figure this thing out. Take the attitude of the old fellow, you know, he was on his 100th birthday and some smart addict said, well, Gramp, you gonna try for 200? He said, well, let's put it this way. He said, I'm a lot stronger than I was on my first one. <laughs> some other smart addict came up to him and said, uh, Gramp, can you play the piano? He said, I don't know. And he said, what do you mean you don't know? He said, I never tried. Now, you see, traditionally, a lot of people would say, well, no, I don't know. Why? I've never tried. Then how do you know you can't if you've never tried? If there's an occasion, I say, give it your best shot. When you do the things you ought to do, when you ought to do them, you will eventually be able to do the things you want to do when you want to do them. Very significant. Do it now. If you've got an assignment that you don't want to do, do it now. You'll get it done sooner and with less hassle. They'll probably praise you when you do, but if you delay starting, they will criticize you almost regardless of what happens as a result of you doing it. Stay with it. Persistence is important. I know you heard the one that Dr. Charles Lowry uh, tells about the fellow who had never done real well in life, and he finally conceived of an idea for a new soft drink, and he called it Four Up. Well, he put a good marketing effort behind it, you know, but it just didn't quite click. So he went back to the drawing board, and he worked some more, and really uh, spent a considerable amount of time and effort and money on it, and he came back with Five Up. And again, it was close, but it just didn't quite have it. And then one more time, he gave it a shot, and this time he made the supreme effort, and he called it Six Up. Well, that one didn't quite make it either, and he threw in the towel. If he'd only known how close he was. <laughs> Now, like a lot of humorous stories, this one has a lesson in it. Make failure your teacher, not your undertaker. A detour, not a dead end street. Learn to love your work. And, you know, the interesting thing is, I believe we can learn to love our work with an adjustment in our attitude and looking at it as to what we like to do and how we can improve on whatever the job is. Charles Kettering, for a number of years, was a section foreman with General Motors. And he once had an opportunity, a bum came to him while they were on the job, and the bum asked him for money for lunch. Mr. Kettering said, no, I uh, won't give you money for lunch, but I will take you to lunch. So he took him to lunch and bought him a good lunch. And the man said, now, you know, I really am not accustomed to begging. I would like to work for you in order to pay you back for the meal. And Mr. Kettering said, all right, said, let's come over here and I've got something I'll get you to do. And it was simply to dig a hole in the ground that they had a need for right there. 
And Charles Kettering showed him how to dig a hole. He showed him exactly how to square it away, how to make certain it was perfectly straight, how to make certain it was perfectly level. And as Charles Kettering was digging the hole and showing the man, he demonstrated a considerable amount of pride in the way the hole ought to be dug in the ground. And then the man took over and he started working on it and he did a magnificent job. So good as a matter of fact that Mr. Kettern gave him a job. Later on the man became a foreman for him. And the man said to Mr. Kettern, you know, had anybody showed me early in life the importance of doing whatever you do well and taking pride in whatever you do, then I never would have been without a job. Work gives us more than a, a living. Work gives us our life. You perhaps have heard the story, but there's so much truth in it, I'll share it with you again. Years ago in the Smoky Mountains, some domestic hogs got loose, several of them. And they started living in the wilds. Over a period of a number of generations, they got progressively wilder and wilder until they had so adjusted to the area uh, that they were as wild as any hog could possibly be. And they were very dangerous. So the local people decided they needed to figure out a way to get rid of them. So they hired hunters, but the hogs were extraordinarily smart and they never could kill the hogs. And so one day an old man showed up in the village there on the top of this mountainside and he had a donkey cart and there was some lumber in the back of the donkey cart and some grain. And he announced to the curious people around that he was going up on the mountain to catch the hogs. Well, they kind of laughed at the old man and he said, well, don't worry about it. I'll be back uh, with the hogs and let you know where I've got them trapped. Well, about three weeks later, he came back down and said, well, if you go up such and such a place, you'll find them all enclosed in this pen. And they said, well, how on earth did you manage to do it? He said, well, the first thing I did when I got up there, he said, I just simply laid the lumber out on the ground and then I spread some of the grain. Now, the old boar who was in charge was watching all of this from out in the woods and he led the sows and the little pigs up with him and they sniffed around there and it probably took them a couple of hours before they were willing to take a bite of that grain. It was there and it was good and it was free and, and so they took a bite. He said, the next day I went back, I dug four post holes, and I simply put a post up in either one of those, and I put more grain right in the center. And he said, they were skeptical at first, but there the grain was just like before. And he said, by doing that, uh, over a period of about two weeks, I gradually built a fence up and set the trap door, and then I put a lot of the grain in there, and sure enough, the lure of something for nothing, the free lunch, had captured them. They walked in, I sprung the lock. See, that to me really tells us a great deal. It says that when you make a wild animal dependent upon man for his food, you destroy his resourcefulness and he's in trouble. You do exactly the same thing when you treat man that way. That's the real difficulty with much of the welfare in our society. The tragedy of this country has been the treatment we have accorded the American Indian over a period of our country's history. We signed any number of treaties with them. We have said, lay down your arms and we will, quote, take care of you. We put them on reservations. And all you've got to do is go to the reservations and you will see what Uncle Sam means when he says, I'll take care of you. I'll tell you, I don't believe there's anybody that's a bigger flag waver than old Zig, as I will share with you a little bit later. Uh, but if you want to create a cripple, just give a man a pair of crutches for a few months or give him a free lunch long enough for him to get in the habit of getting something for nothing. It's old but true, you give a man a fish and you feed him for the day. But if you'll teach him to fish, you will literally feed him for life. When you give a man a dole, you deny him his dignity and you rob him of his destiny.
Change attitudes about your job from something you gotta do to something you get to do. And there'll be a big difference in your performance. My son and I were coming back from Phoenix after the Christmas holidays one day about five years ago. I had for several years gone out there to play in the Fellowship of Christian Athletes a Pro-Am Golf Tournament. My son was playing with me this time. As we were coming back, we were, as always, enthused and excited and uh, having fun. And as we walked up to the gate agent there, and I put the tickets up there, I said to the gate agent, I said, well, how you doing? He said, compared to what? <laughs> I said, compared to the people who, unlike you, do not have a magnificent job with a wonderful company, living in America and the free enterprise system, where you enjoy all of the freedoms that life has to offer, a marvelous opportunity to get ahead on the job which you have and render real service to your fellow man, and who also enjoys good health all at the same time. I said, how you doing? He grinned from ear to ear and he said, I'm doing this a whole lot better than I was one minute ago. <laughs> And interestingly enough, he moved both of us up to first class. Now, I, uh, I, I, I like that. I really did. <clears throat> but you change your attitude from is something I got to do to something I get to do. And when you realize that we got millions of people who don't get to do a job, then it's easy to understand. I love the story of the two ladies at uh, Western Union. They had grown very disgruntled with their jobs. They were just miserable about it. They were unhappy, to say the least. And so they decided they'd had enough. They were going to quit. And they were going to quit this Friday afternoon. Well, Thursday night, they got together to, quote, plan for the next day. They had an idea, which is always dangerous. And they decided that uh, they were going to go in early the next morning before anybody else did. They were going to really dress neatly for this last day. They would get there and they'd clean up the kitchen and the area around, get everything spick and span. They would make the coffee and then when the early workers started arriving, they would make it a point to serve each one a cup of coffee and be very gracious and kind and pleasant with them. So they did that, and the first little unsuspected employee comes walking in, a little lady. The two gals that had uh, concocted this little deal, one of them greeted the older lady and said, Well, good morning. I had no idea that you always came in this early. My, you look nice today. Come on in. You know, I have made a pot of coffee. Sit down. I want to serve it for you. Well, she was some more flabbergasted because she knew this lady and she knew what kind of attitude she had uh, been having. So she thanked her very profusely and said, well, I really appreciate this. Thank you very much. The second lady walked in and they gave her the same treatment and the third and the fourth. Well, along about now, the first customer comes in and one of the ladies greets her enthusiastically and said, my, you know, you're our first customer today and I can already tell we're going to have a wonderful day because I'll bet you everybody today is going to be just like you, pleasant and cheerful and friendly. And the customer looked at her in absolute astonishment and said, well, my goodness alive, thank you very much. I really appreciate being greeted this way. All day long, it goes on just like this. About four o'clock this afternoon, there was a breather and the two ladies got together for a fast confab and one of them says to the other one, are you going to tell them or do you want me to tell them? And the one she was talking to said, tell them what? Well, you know, tell them that uh, we're going to quit today. She said, quit? The best job I ever had? Are you kidding me? <laughs> now, as I understand it, that literally is a true story. When you change your attitude about your job, it'll make a dramatic difference about your performance on the job. Profound statement, what you do off the job plays a major part in how far you go on the job. Getting ready for going to work. For example, if you're going to ever have to miss a day's work, let me just encourage you, do everything in your power not to make it a Monday and not to make it a Friday. Now, why is that? It's very simple. The rate of absenteeism is dramatically higher on Monday and Friday than any other days of the week. 
Your need to be there, therefore, is much greater. Your need to be there is great. You should never miss unless it's absolutely out of your hands. But if it's humanly possible, you especially want to be there on Mondays and on Friday. You'll score more points with management if you do. Now, you're supposed to score points every day, and you do when you do the job properly. Be demanding of yourself. Coach John Wooden of UCLA said there's no great fun, satisfaction, or joy derived from doing something that's easy. Failure is not fatal, but failure to change might be. Now, Coach Wooden, you know, was the most successful basketball coach in history. Never had a losing season. Won 10 of 12 national championships at UCLA. Seven of them in a row. Wooden said that he considered a player's morals just as carefully as he considered his quickness. We need to understand that effort is the key, but direction and loyalty are paramount. It makes no sense to do a super job on what you should not be doing at all. Efficiency is doing things right. Effectiveness is doing the right things efficiently. Hard work plus traditional values are the answer. Let me share these statistics with you. At Corn Ferry International, in conjunction with the UCLA School of Management, they did a study of 1,361 vice presidents who had an average income of $215,000. The most successful ones had been on their jobs over 15 years and they'd only held two jobs. 87% of them were still married to their one and only mate. 89% of them had two, three, four or more children. 71% said integrity was their most important asset and 100% of them said that hard work was the key to their success. U.S. News and World Report, January 13, 1986, discussed the one million millionaires in America. 20 to 30 years has been their average length of time they took to acquire their fortune, and they earned their money by supplying basic human needs. Less than 1%, and here's something I really want you to listen to because this ties to something else that's so important. Less than 1% of the millionaires in America earned their money in music, radio, TV, the movies, entertainment, or athletics. All of those put together, less than 1% had earned their money in all of those fields combined. The Honorable Clarence Pendleton, the chairman of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, personally told me as a result of studies they had done that particularly in the black community where there's been so many false hopes raised about here's the way to get to the top. Do it in athletics, in music, and entertainment. Mr. Pendleton told me that the odds are 1,000 times as great that that young black athlete will become a successful doctor or lawyer as they are that he will become a professional athlete. Now, when you start thinking about what I was saying in the last presentation about desire, that's one of the reasons I told the story about the young man that had the desire, an overwhelming desire, and yet he failed. I think if we can start aiming our young people at goals where they've got a thousand times as good a chance of getting there, that we will have rendered our country and them a much, much greater service. The Lewis Harris poll of those people who had an income of $142,000 a year or more and had a net worth in excess of a half million dollars, not including the home, described these successful people as being unexciting, middle-aged, cautious, they stressed family values, and the work ethic. 83% of them were married, 96% acquired their net worth through hard work. 80% are politically conservative or middle of the road, and they are relatively non-materialistic. 
Their major objective was to provide for the family. 85% said that was the major objective, and only 11% rated owning an expensive car as being very high up on the totem pole. Prestige and the badge of success don't matter to them nearly as much as family, education, and their business or job. Not much excitement, but lots of happiness. They have a good standard of living, but infinitely more important, they have an excellent quality of life. Persistent, consistent, disciplined hard work makes the difference. Thomas Edison is often thought of as being the predominant inventive genius of our country's history. In fact, he did have such a long row of successful inventions. But when you consider all of the work that he did, it really is easy to understand why he had so many inventions. The story is told that a young reporter came to him one time and said, Mr. Edison, I understand you've been working on one experiment for over 10,000 times. It was his efforts to invent the incandescent light. And uh, Mr. Edison said, that's right. And he asked him the question, how does it feel to have failed 10,000 times at anything? Mr. Edison said, young man, you're just getting started in life, so let me tell you this and please don't ever forget it. I have not failed 10,000 times. He said, I have successfully found 10,000 ways which will not work. <laughs> It's a difference in attitude. Jerry West, one of the all-time great basketball players in the NBA. When Jerry was a youngster, he was so bad that the kids on the playground would not even let him play with them. When he got into school where they had a gym, he used to lag behind the other boys and they would close the gym and everybody else would be gone. Jerry could not turn the lights on, and so he had to shoot in the shadows there. And he spent hour after hour after hour just being able to make out the outline of the basket, and he developed that touch for hitting that basket almost in complete darkness. That's the reason he went on to become one of the all-time shooting guards in the history of the NBA. It takes a lot of effort. My friend Joel Weldon, an outstanding speaker from Phoenix, Arizona, tells a story that I think has so much merit. The Chinese plant a seed to raise a tree. It's called the Chinese bamboo tree. And they water and fertilize that seed the first year, but nothing happens. The second year, they water it and they fertilize it again, and nothing happens. The third year, they water it and they fertilize it again, and nothing happens. The fourth year, they water it and they fertilize it again, and nothing happens. The fifth year, they water and fertilize that tree again. And sometimes during the course of the fifth year, in a process or in a period of roughly six weeks, the Chinese bamboo tree grows roughly 90 feet. But the question is, did it grow 90 feet in six weeks or did it grow 90 feet in five years? And the answer is obvious. Because had there been any year when they did not water it and fertilize it, there would have been no Chinese bamboo tree. Many times we will work and work and work and nothing happens. We will work again and nothing happens. And then we have that final effort, and we've seen it, not necessarily the final effort, but we have seen it happen where people all of a sudden become overnight successes. I'm sure you have seen those yourself. Somebody once said that failure is the line of least persistence. Success occurs when opportunity meets preparation. I believe that is true. One of the most intriguing stories I've heard is the story of Demosthenes. Most of you recognize that name as being the name of the great Greek orator who scaled oratorical heights that they say have never been equaled before. Well, a lot of people do not realize it, but when he was a young man, they had a law on their books that if the inheritance left by their father were challenged by anyone else in public debate, that the person who challenged them in debate, if they won the debate, could literally win their fortune. Demosthenes did have a speech difficulty. He was also very shy and very awkward. 
He was embarrassed and humiliated in the debate. Not only did he lose all his self-respect, but he also lost his family fortune. But he did not lose his will and his determination. And he started practicing. And it is a literal truth, or so I have been told, that he did go to the seashore and that he did put those pebbles in his mouth and that he did stand out there and he did project his voice as he spoke into the waves and the wind. And over a period of time, by being an excellent student and an extraordinarily hard worker, he became famous the world over for his oratorical skills. History does not record the name of the man who literally stole his fortune, for well, they've certainly been saying kind things about Demosthenes for several hundred years. President Calvin Coolidge put it this way, nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence, determination, and hard work make the difference. Vince Lombardi, the legendary coaching genius who was the only man to ever coach three consecutive world championship football teams, once said, I've never known a man worth his salt who in the long run, deep down in his heart, did not appreciate the grind and the discipline. There is something in good men that truly yearns for and needs discipline. World famous cellist Pablo Casals, long after he had achieved international recognition as an artist, still practiced six hours every day. Someone asked him why the continued effort. His reply was simply, I think I'm making progress. The opportunity for greatness doesn't knock. It's inside every one of us. However, we must work to get it out. We're often told to strike while the iron is hot, which is good advice. Better advice, however, is to make the iron hot by striking. Yes, persistence pays off. Life is tough. It's not where you start, but when you finish, that makes the difference. It really does make a difference. Harry Kahn, in his beautiful book, The Four Trojan Horses of Humanism, writes about the book, Who's Who of America. Now, that's different from Who's Who in America. In this book, they discovered that it takes 25,000 laboring families to produce one member of Who's Who in America. It takes 5,000 lawyers to produce one member of who's who in their families. 2,500 dentists, and they will produce one family member who will be a member of who's who. It takes seven Christian missionary families to produce one member of who's who. Now I wonder why. That's a good question. And I believe as I've reflected on that, that their predominant reason is that of all of the people on the face of this earth who have to have A, the most faith, B, who have to struggle the hardest under the most difficult circumstances, C, who have to learn how to get along with strange people in a strange land, learning ingenuity, D, who have to really be able to work and improvise and sacrifice E, those who have to learn how to deal with frustrations and heartbreak and disappointments and defeats and setbacks, that when you put all of those factors together, the bottom line is the end results are absolutely magnificent. No, it's not easy. Nowhere in any of this have I ever even hinted that it was going to be easy because it is not but the rewards are absolutely tremendous. Now, just as a matter of curiosity, how many of you here in this live audience have noticed this old chrome-plated water pump sitting up front? Can I see your hand? Very good. We've got an alert audience here this evening. You know, almost without exception, when I get aboard an aircraft with this old chrome-plated pump, I am the only passenger who's got one. 
So I assume by that that they're getting fairly scarce. I've saved this old pump story for the very last of uh, this particular presentation because I believe this pump is quite a story. I honestly believe that if you've missed everything I've had to say up until right now, but if you'll get the message of the pump, I believe this alone is going to be worth your time and effort. Good friend of mine, Bernard Haygood, and his brother-in-law, Jimmy Glenn, were out riding in the South Alabama foothills one day a number of years ago. It was a brutally hot August day, and they got thirsty. Bernard pulled behind this old abandoned farmhouse, and he saw this old pump, and he hopped out of the car, he ran over, and he grabbed the handle, and he started to pump. Now, just as a matter of curiosity, how many of you here in this live audience have ever used one of these old pumps? Can I see? Hey, we got some pumpers in the crowd tonight. Well, that's good. Old Bernard with us a pump in a way, you know. And after a couple of minutes, he said, Jimmy, you're going to have to get that old bucket over there and dip some water out of the creek. We're going to have to prime the pump. How many of you know what I'm talking about when I say you have to prime the pump? Well, old Bernard, they put the water in. Old Bernard with us a pump in a way. You know, and after a few minutes, he said, you know, Jim, I don't believe it's in the water down there. And old Jim said, yeah, it is, Bernard. You know, in South Alabama, the wells are deep. We're glad they are because the deeper the well, the cooler, the cleaner, the sweeter, the purer, the better taste in the water is. And that's pretty much the way it is in life, isn't it? Isn't it true that the things we have to work the hardest for are the things which really have the most value? Isn't it true that the promotion that we really have to hustle to get means the most to us? Isn't it true that the subject that's the most difficult to learn, we appreciate it the most when we know it? Isn't it true that the girl or the guy who is the prize, the one who is most difficult to get to go with us, isn't that the one that we really get the most excited about? Well, old Bernard wanted to drink water. I mean, it is hot, and he is thirsty, and it is August, you know, and he was just uh, working away. But the question comes up is just uh, how much work are you willing to do in order to get a drink of water? So finally, old Bernard just threw up his hand. He said, Jimmy, I just don't believe it's in the water down there. Jimmy said, don't stop, Bernard, don't stop. If you stop, the water goes all the way back down, and then we're going to have to start all over. How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? You see, there's a couple of magnificent lessons already. First of all, in order to get some water out, you got to put something in. you got to prime the pump. So many people stand in front of the stove of life, and they say, now, stove, you give me some heat, and then I'll put some wood in you. So many times the employee goes to the employer and says, give me a raise, then I'll start coming to work on time. So many times uh, the student will say, teacher, I know I haven't studied this quarter. I know that I really haven't done well. But if I take a failing grade home, my mama's going to skin me alive. Give me a good grade this time, teacher. And if you do, I promise you, I'll really study next go round. But what they're really saying is reward me and then I'll perform. But it doesn't work that way. If it did, can't you just imagine the old farmer saying, Lord, I know it's true, didn't plant a thing this year, but if you'll give me a good crop, Lord, next year I'll just plant more than anybody. That's not the way it works. You got to put something in before you can expect to get something out. And then you're going to have to do a whole lot of pumping. And if you ever stop, what happens to the water in there? goes all the way back down. A lot of times we miss out an awful lot of good effort because we don't expend a little bit more. Well, when old Jimmy grabbed a hold of that, I mean, he really went to work. And you see what I'm really saying is this. Once you get started and get that water to flowing, then all you got to do is keep a little easy, steady pressure on it you're going to end up getting more water than you know what to do with. Have you ever noticed that when things are good, they get better? When they're bad, they get worse. And it's got nothing whatever to do with what's going on out there. It's got everything to do with what's going on between your ears. You know what the basic problem most people have? They get involved in a new project. They say, well, I just kind of piddle around a little bit. And if it, if it works out, that'll be good. And if it doesn't work out, uh, that's okay too. I mean, nothing ventured, nothing gained. But you can pump like that a long time and nothing's gonna happen. When you first get involved in something, you really gotta get after it. 
And then once you get it to flow, and uh, then all you got to do is keep that easy, steady pressure on it. You know what I like about this? I like the fact that this has nothing to do with your age or education. It has nothing to do with whether you're black or white or old or young or male or female or extrovert or introvert or well-educated or uneducated. The thing I like about this is it simply says that as free people, it is our God-given right to work as long as we wish, as hard as we wish, and as enthusiastically as we wish to accomplish our objectives in life. I believe that is what America is all about. Keep persisting. Keep working. Because if you do, I'll see you at the top. Thank you. Thank you. It seems that this uh, certain pastor had a deacon who had a bad habit of using extraordinarily profane language. I mean, he would just cut loose on occasion and really cuss up a blue streak. Well, the other deacons were concerned about it. The pastor was concerned about it. They talked with him, you know, and, and somehow or another, it seems he would just keep forgetting. And one day the pastor went to him and just confronted him directly and he said, now we're just going to have to put a stop to this cussing. And the deacon said, well, pastor said, I have tried so hard. Maybe if me and you went fishing together and you prayed with me and counseled with me throughout the fishing trip, said, maybe that's all I need. And the pastor said, all right, in the interest of your future well-being, he said, I'm willing to do that. So the day was set, they got their boat, and they went out in the lake, and just getting started, and the pastor threw his line over first, and sure enough, a 14-pound bass hit that sucker. He just bent that line double, and all the excitement that was going on, you cannot believe. And the deacon was encouraging the pastor, and the pastor was reeling him in, you know, and he got him up in the air, and the deacon had the net there. He's going to slip it up under that big old bass and pull him in, when at the last precise instant... The line broke and that big old bass got away. The deacon looked at the pastor and the pastor looked at the deacon and the pastor said to the deacon, Brother Deacon, he said somebody ought to say something. Well, I'm going to say two somethings if you want to know the truth about it. First of all, I would like to start out by identifying the problem uh, or a couple of them in our society. James Baldwin was 100% right when he said, confrontation does not always bring a solution to the problem, but until you confront the problem, there is no chance that you're going to be able to solve that problem. In our America, we have a problem with two basic groups of people. They're the ones who take the ostrich approach. They're in denial that we've got a problem. They even think denial is just an Egyptian river. I mean, they do not really identify with the problem at all. They believe they ought to just bury their head in the sands. They do not believe it really exists, and all they got to do is deny it, and therefore there will be no problem. Uh, the second group uh, believes that there is nothing we can do. It's all over. It's too late. We had our chance and we missed it. Let me address the first group just a little bit more, those who don't think there's a problem. I might relate it to the passenger pigeon. I don't know what you know about your history of the passenger pigeon, but according to World Book Encyclopedia, when Daniel Boone was traipsing the hills and mountains of Tennessee and Kentucky and North Carolina, 
passenger pigeon flocks were so great that they literally blocked out the sun. There is one recorded flock that was over 50 miles wide and as much as 200 miles long. They claim that there were up to a half a billion pigeons in that one single flock, that it literally blocked out the sun. They said that Daniel Boone used to kill those pigeons, not by shooting them, but simply by standing on the hillside and knocking them down with his gun butt as they came by. I can just imagine somebody along about that time saying, now, Daniel, you better not kill so many of them pigeons. We're going to run out one day. And can't you imagine him standing there knocking those pigeons down and saying, man, what you talking about? Just look at the pigeons. But they buried the last one in 1914. They did run out. Freedom is pretty much that way. We can lose our freedoms one by one, and we can lose our momentum bit by bit until the day comes when we will no longer be the nation that we are today. Now, let me remind you, if you think that's an impossibility, at one time, of course, Rome was the dominant power in the world, and so was Greece and Macedonia. So was Germany, so was France, and so was England, and so was Spain. Persia at one time was the dominant force in existence, and so was Mongolia one time, the number one force in the world. But one by one, they all went by the boards. My fear is what I call the bullfrog theory, that we will fall victim to that. I know you've probably heard that if you want to boil a bullfrog, you don't boil him by throwing him in boiling water. If you do, he'll just pop out as fast as you pop in. What you do is you put the bullfrog in cold water and set him on a stove, and then you turn the heat on. And that water begins to warm up a little bit, you know, and the old bullfrog in there says, Mmm, Man, that feels good. Oh, boy, that really, that's nice. Man, I like that warm water. Ooh, that feels good. Matter of fact, it makes me a little drowsy. I just think I'll take myself a little nap. And, of course, he wakes up dead. <laughs> when you gradually let things slip up on you, that's when it is so absolutely dangerous. Of the two groups, one who says nothing's wrong and the other who says it's too late, I simply am going to have the audacity to say that I believe there is a solution. What can we do? Number one, we can sell America to Americans. Now, we don't have to worry about selling America to anybody else because they're lining up by the tens of millions. Let me in, man, let me in, let me in. Border to border, coast to coast, from all over the world. They're begging and pleading and standing in line. Give me part of America. Give me the dream that is yours. Let me share part of it. But the problem is, the rest of the world has already bought America, but we have grown so accustomed to what we have, we take it for granted. We fuss about little inconveniences, not realizing just how much we do have to be grateful for. Let's go back in our history just a little bit and uh, learn how we're going to sell America to Americans. I love what old Patrick Henry said, and I think we've got to put these not only back in the history books, we need to dramatize them in recordings and let our kids be hearing them all the time. As he stood up in that assembly that day and said, Is life so dear? or peace so sweet, as to be purchased at the price of chains of slavery, forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Our kids and our adults need to be hearing John Paul Jones as he uttered those immortal words, I have not yet begun to fight. They need to hear Nathan Hale as he goes ringing down history saying, I regret that I have but one life to give for my country. A 21-year-old patriot who refused to capitulate. We need to let everybody hear the words of Admiral Farragut as he went steaming into Mobile Bay with those words, damn the torpedoes, full speed 
ahead. It needs to be full speed ahead for America. We need to start teaching the real history of America. Maybe the most startling statement that you will hear me make is this one. 99% of the students in our American schools have never been taught the real history of America. I challenge you to buy a book. It is the most exciting book I have read in the last 10 years. The title of the book is The Light and the Glory. It is written by Peter Marshall and David Manuel. It reads like a novel. When you get started in it, you will be unable to put it down. It tells exactly how America was discovered, exactly what happened there when the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock, how they landed at the only place, at the only time it would have been safe for them to have landed. You will learn how Washington really is the incredible leader that uh, many people still do not quite give him credit for. When you study what happened there, it will make a difference in your feelings about this country. We especially need to be teaching that to our kids so they can have the same pride and excitement and enthusiasm that we have. To build America, we need to build our strength. Theodore Roosevelt was 100% right when he said, you speak softly, but you carry a big stick. We need to be strong, ladies and gentlemen. We need to turn the eagle loose and let him fly. Let our kids see the magnificent bird up there. Did you know that the American eagle from 5,000 feet up in the air can literally, and is the only bird on earth that can do this, can literally look right into the teeth of the sun? There's a protective coating that pulls down over those eyes and he can stare right at the sun without any harm. And the next instant, he can drop those eyes and spot a field mouse five thousand feet below. That's America. Strong enough to look in the eye of the strongest nation on earth. Step number two, the Baron de Tocqueville, the French royalist, who was touring our country during the 1830s, made an observation which is so very, very true. He said, I've been in your homes and in your factories. I've seen the fields and the streams. I've seen the richness of the land, the harvest of your crops. I've seen the productivity of your factories. I've seen the richness of your seas. And I've seen all of the wonderful things there, the way your government functions. And all of these are magnificent. I went to those places looking for the strength of America. But it wasn't until I got into your churches that I found the strength, the real strength of America. America is great because America is good. And as long as America continues to be good, America will continue to be great. And if it ever ceases to be good, it will cease to be great. Let me tell you how we can make certain our country will always be free. We have the research to prove beyond any doubt we know what it takes for an individual to be successful. We know that. We know that if we've got an individual who is honest and has character and integrity, who is loyal and has trust and love, who has a good attitude, is a hard worker, has the courage to take action, we know from what we have learned and documented with scientific studies that this is going to make an individual successful. And again, I'm talking about more than a standard of living. I'm talking about quality of life. Well, now, if those are the things that will make an individual successful, what will make a nation successful? Isn't it true that the more successful individuals we have, that the more successful our nation is going to be? Can you buy that idea? Does that ring your bell intellectually as well as emotionally, I hope? then why don't we make it an absolute law that in our educational structure that we teach our kids the importance of these qualities right here. We need to be teaching our kids how to work. We need to be teaching everybody that each individual is important. Did you know that with one more vote, Andrew Johnson would have been impeached? One more vote by a cancer-stricken farmer who rode from New Jersey to Philadelphia in a blinding hailstorm. 
is what made that declaration a unanimous one that magnificent day. We need to be selling everybody that they are important, their vote is important. One more vote in the state of Illinois. And Richard Nixon, had he gotten the vote instead of John F. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy would never have been the president of the United States. One more vote, ladies and gentlemen, can make a dramatic difference. Step number three, if America is going to maintain its world leadership position and get to the area of strength that it really is capable of getting to, we need to eradicate illiteracy. Again, I go back to Japan, and I don't mean to keep waving their flag, but I simply want to say this. In Japan today, 1% of the population is illiterate. In America, 27% of the population is illiterate. We've got to do something about solving that particular problem. Did you know that it cost us $400,000 in lost taxes every time a student drops out of high school? The difference in their earnings and the taxes they would pay on that for the rest of their working life is over $400,000. We simply cannot afford these rates of illiteracy. There's a lot of things that we can do. I think Jan McBaron, who's a physician in Columbus, Georgia, has set an example as an individual. She is teaching one by one adult illiterates to read. If every corporation in America would make it their corporate objective to start teaching one by one the people in their communities and areas how to read, it can make a dramatic difference. George Kettle in Washington, D.C. is a classic example of what can happen when somebody gets excited about this project. He donated $300,000, put it in trust, he went to one of the schools there in Washington, which is in one of the really tough areas, went to the sixth grade, and he said to those kids, I'm putting this money in trust for you. You've got a college education waiting on you when you get out of here. First of all, though, you have got to qualify by good grades. You have got to be of sound character when you get through. You have got to have followed the rules which we've set up. In one year, that class went from one of the very worst in the entire city to one of the very best. You've heard it said a number of times, if there is faith in the future, there's power in the present. When these kids saw that they had some faith in the future, then they really started understanding and believing in that future. We've got to do that with our illiterates and those people who've never really had a chance in life. Each one of us has got to get involved in it. Now, without any disrespect to our government, the government cannot do it. We've been putting billions and billions and billions of dollars in public education, and the reality is, and there are other factors involved, but the reality is the rate of illiteracy is increasing and increasing and increasing. We've got to get citizens involved, individuals, corporate. We've also got to get the churches involved in this very worthwhile project. Let me say the step number four is we need to start with a statement. We need to stop the bleeding. 2,160,000 people have lost their life in the last six years as a direct result of smoking cigarettes. Now the government's spending billions to subsidize tobacco. Now where in the name of common sense can that happen? We need to do something about it. According to the American Medical Association Journal, which I read this date, in October 1987, their publication, the average person who dies from a smoking-related cause loses 15 years of lifespan. Tobacco in our society creates a year of employment for one person in exchange for seven and one-half years of life for every person killed by tobacco use. We invest about $30 billion a year in smoking. The farmer gets a little over a billion of that. Did you know that it cost $4,611 a year more to hire a smoker than it does a non-smoker? 
Now, because there's so many statistics involved, I'm not going to share them with you. But if you want to challenge me on that, drop me a note in the mail. I'll send you the whole kit and the caboodle right there. And those are 1982 figures. It cost an enormous amount. Now, I recognize this kind of information is not going to make everybody happy. But the bleeding which has taken place as a result of that is incredible. We spend 60 cents, according to Paul Harvey, out of every health care dollar in our society, 60 cents of it goes to the treatment of tobacco-related illnesses and alcohol-related illnesses. We zero in on those two problems, and we can do something about our problems financially, not to mention health-wise. Now, follow me mathematically, if you will. In 1987, Americans smoked roughly 600 billion cigarettes. That's spelled with a B. Now, divide that by 20, the number of cigarettes in a packet, that means they bought 30 billion packages of cigarettes. If they will just charge an extra 50 cents tax, that will start out by raising $15 billion. Now, what do we do with the $15 billion? We take one-third of it, $5 billion, go to every tobacco farmer in America and bribe them. <laughs> and we say to them, we will give you seven times the average earnings for the last seven years that you have been raising tobacco. In other words, take their average earnings from tobacco the last seven years, multiply that by seven, and forever prohibit that land or that farmer from ever using that land to farm for tobacco again. Now, what can they do with that money? Well, first of all, they can start developing greenhouse crops exotic fruits and vegetables that we need in our country that will be good for our people and otherwise. And then we can take that other 10 billions of dollars as an example, put about $5 billion of it in extremely low finance housing. If somebody's working on minimum wage, loan them the money, let's say at 2%, until they can get on their feet and get into some housing which is decent for them. We will still have $5 billion left, ladies and gentlemen, for the 101 other things that we can find to use the money for. I don't know how it grabs you. I get excited about it. To me, that makes nothing but sense. Every time you light up a cigarette, you're going to kill yourself 14 minutes earlier than you otherwise would. Let's get serious. Let's demand from our legislators that something be done about this incredible problem. Step number five, let's get booze off of television. I know that'll make me a lot of friends in some areas of the country, but in 1984, we spent $60 billion on booze. But we had alcohol-related problems of $120.8 billion. For every dollar we take in in taxes, our society, that's you and me, we're spending nearly $10 for societal-related problems because of the booze. Here's the frightening part. There are 16 million problem drinkers in America today, and 3 million of them are teenagers. I got to studying this some 15 years ago. 15 years ago, one person in 15 who took a casual drink ended up with a drinking problem. Today, one person in seven who takes a casual drink will end up with a drinking problem. Drinking is no longer just socially acceptable, it is socially demanded. You're expected to have it wherever you go. Fifteen times out of sixteen when booze is offered on television, it is accepted. We need to take it off television, the advertising. We need to increase the tax 25%. That would bring in an extra 15 billions of dollars. You might say, but Ziegler, don't you want people to have any fun? 
Well, we've got 20 million adult children of alcoholics. They're not having much fun as a result of being raised in an alcoholic family in most cases. We have 16 million problem drinkers. They are certainly not having any fun. We have 15 million minor children of problem drinkers. And when you put all of that together, it's horrendous. 90% of wife abuse is directly traced to alcohol abuse. They're not having any fun. 70% of our divorces come because partially of drinking. They're not having any fun. 50% of our highway deaths are because of drinking. That's no fun. And 50% of the people who are under the care of a professional are there because of drinking. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a problem. We need to get involved in the political process. We need to study the issues, find out what candidates believe. Not that politician is not what we're going to be saying anymore. That's not the mayor. He is my mayor. He is my congressman. He is my senator. He is my president. We need to take responsibility by putting the right ones in there. Each American needs to study to be informed to stand up to be counted, we need to sound off to be heard and go to work to make a great America even greater. Now I'd like to take you on a trip to give you an inner overview of this great land of ours. Over the years, it's been my privilege to have seen this land from every different angle, I do believe. A lot of people never really have that privilege. I would like to take you on a fast trip around America and I would like to introduce you to some of the really outstanding people who really epitomize what this land is all about. We want to start here in Dallas because we have two of the most remarkable Americans who've ever lived right here in Dallas. One is no longer with us. Her name is Mary Crowley. The other one is Mary Kay. Both of these ladies started and built monumental businesses, each doing in excess of a half a billion dollars worth of business a year. They founded them on the basis of we're going to put God first, family second, and the company is going to be third. What a marvelous concept to build a business on. The other one, of course, is Ross Perot, and his story, of course, is absolutely legendary. He came driving an old used Plymouth with his possessions in the back seat of his car right here in town. And, of course, today we know that Mr. Perot is worth not only hundreds of millions of dollars, but well over a billion dollars as well. But I want us to kind of hit all of the country. Let's get aboard our jet and fly up to New York City. I have a good friend up there. His name is Jim Giordano. Jim Giordano was a young fella who won a scholarship to Harvard from that New York City public school. No member of his family had ever been into college. He did so well that he got into med school, but after a couple of years of med school, he realized that wasn't for him, and he got interested in free enterprise and what it would really mean to him, and so he started seeking employment on Wall Street. And though he was a college graduate from Harvard University, it still took him six months to get a job with Merrill Lynch. They said that we'll only give you a job as a runner. That's 300 bucks a week. Don't expect to be a broker for at least two years. Eight months later, he was a broker. Five years later, he is the managing director and the youngest man at age 25 of a Wall Street brokerage firm. It's Blair and Company, a very wealthy young man at his age. See, that's what America really does afford, is a unique opportunity. Super Bowl Sunday this year was a red-letter day for many of us. We watched uh, two fine teams. Dan Reeves is a friend of mine. Joe Gibbs is a man whom I admire enormously. I watched those teams uh, square off, and I said to myself, well, one thing about it, uh, the good team is going to win today. And it didn't matter which one it was. But as the game progressed and the full impact of what Doug Williams was doing and what it would mean to him and what it would mean to so many of his fans and watching him perform so coolly under fire as he put to rest forever and ever the myth that the black quarterback has no place in the NFL. Uh, what a beacon of light that was and how exciting it was. That's what America is all about. Get aboard the jet with me. Let's fly south. Let's go into Castleberry, Florida. It's just outside of Orlando. I'd like to introduce you to a fellow. His name is Ted Endicott. 
In 1987, Ted was the number one salesman for General Motors automobiles, made in excess of $125,000. He sells an average of over 40 cars a month. He specializes in the soft sell. He doesn't try to overload somebody. If he can see they can't make $300 a month payments, he tries to talk them down and frequently does talk them down into a model which they can afford. Uh, oh, yeah, one thing I neglected to mention, Ted Endicott is blind. See, in America, ladies and gentlemen, we are rewarded on our results. Now, I don't know how tall or short or fat or slim or skin color or whether we're male or female. That's what I like about our land. Let's go westward. We're going to stop in Pensacola just for a moment. We'll go by El Caniz Street, and there's a home, I believe it's still standing. It's where Chappie James was raised. But I really want to talk about Chappie's mother, who was a school teacher. In those days when the schools were segregated, the black schools were simply so inferior that she wanted her children and the neighborhood children to have a good education. So for a nickel a day, she taught them school. But she taught them a whole lot more than that. She taught the qualities that we've been talking about. She said to her school kids, including her son, Chappie, uh, that you need to have your bags packed and ready to go. And when the door of opportunity swings open, you are ready with your bag to go through that door. Incidentally, General Chappie James, four-star general, was head of the North American Air Defense Command, the first black four-star general in our country's history. That's America. Let's leave there and fly over New Orleans. You know, it was in New Orleans that we first gained respect as a national power. When Andrew Jackson and his coonskin boys from the hills of Tennessee defeated the British there. Oh, it was quite an occasion. Get aboard the aircraft again. We're going to see more of the land. We head westward. We're going to fly right over Phoenix, Arizona. In Phoenix, Arizona, really it's in the adjoining town there of Scottsdale. We're not going to stop, but let me tell you about a young student in school there. Her name is Laurie Cox. It was several years ago, and Laurie one day had the incredible idea that students in school ought to be pledging allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. She went to her teacher, and the teacher thought Laurie was some kind of a nut. She said, Laurie, that's old-fashioned. People don't do stuff like that anymore. She went to the principal, and the principal thought she was out of her mind. She told her boyfriend about it. And the boyfriend said, Laurie, you persist in this insane idea, and you and I are through. Her classmates, some of them friends, quote, turned their back on Laurie. But Laurie had an idea. She had an obsession. She had a belief that people who were saluting the flag and giving the Pledge of Allegiance now would never be burning the flag later on. She started collecting signatures, and over 3,000 students signed their names and said, we would like the privilege of saying the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And today at Coronado High School in Scottsdale, Arizona, that's exactly what they do, because one young girl knew that she could make a difference. That's what we need to be teaching in our America today. We're going to leave Arizona. I want to go on out to Anaheim, California. I have the privilege of introducing you to a good friend of mine. His name is Carl Karcher. Now, Carl is a gentle giant of a fellow. He's about six feet, six or seven inches tall. He weighs about 240 pounds. And Carl Karcher bet on himself and the free enterprise system by pledging his financial net worth to get the capital investment necessary to become an entrepreneur. Now that means he honked his 41 model Plymouth for 326 bucks. <laughs> and he opened a rolling hot dog stand on the streets of uh, Los Angeles, California many years ago. Today, Carl Karcher is a most unusual man. He has Carl's Jr.'s restaurants uh, all over the place, 440 of them. They have over 13,000 people affiliated with him. Carl Karcher and his wife, Margaret, are now celebrating their 49th year of marriage. They have 12 kids. They have 42 grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. Uh, worth many, many millions of dollars, he started with a $326 investment. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what America is all about. 
Let's go northward. Let's turn up, and we want to just simply fly over some of the giant sequoias in Northern California. What an amazing sight they present from the air. And I hope you've noticed the lush countryside all over the place. I hope you've noticed the grandeur of the mountains, the rivers, and the valleys. What a beautiful land America is. We go north from there over the state of Wyoming. In Wyoming, there is one county which has more known coal reserves that will supply more energy than all of the known oil reserves all over America. One county with that kind of reserves. Dr. Billy Ray Cox was 100% right when he said, lack of resources is not our problem. It is lack of resourcefulness that is making the difference. And we flat have got the resources and we're developing that resourcefulness. Let's go back eastward. Let's fly over Kansas and Nebraska and the Dakotas. Let's look at Iowa and Illinois, the breadbasket of the world, because we are the land that feeds so many of the others. The best farm land and the best farmers in the whole world. We want to stop in Detroit. I had a privilege a few years ago of meeting a lady. Her name was Ilona Zimmersman. She was recognized as the number one real estate salesperson in the entire metropolitan Detroit area. When I talked with her, I could scarcely understand what she was saying because she was from Hungary. She had escaped from her native land at night when the communists overran it. Living on roots and berries, she made her way out of that land, and when she got to Detroit, she still carried that guttural accent. But she was enormously successful because she never thought about selling a house on a piece of land. She always was selling a home on a little piece of the greatest land on the face of this earth. Oh, what a privilege it is to be an American. Let's come south and fly over the town of Nashville, Tennessee. Man who publishes some of my books, Sam Moore, is a publisher there. Many years ago, he came here from Lebanon. When he first arrived, he got a job working in a grocery store at night, working in a service station during the day, pumping gasoline, knocking bugs off windshields in the days when service stations were service stations. Today, he's the largest publisher of Bibles in the world and a very successful book publisher. We're going to leave Nashville, Tennessee. I want us to go down to Montgomery, Alabama. That's where so much of our history really has taken place in the last 25 or 30 years. It was in Montgomery, Alabama that one day a black lady got on a bus and her feet hurt. The bus driver said to her, you sit in the back. She had seated herself up front. She simply said, my feet hurt. The bus driver said, you'll have to get up and go to the back. She refused to get up and move back. And that's when an entire people stood up and moved forward. That's where Martin Luther King's civil rights movement really got its start, was with that black lady who refused to get up and move. One person, ladies and gentlemen, can make a dramatic difference in our society. Don't ever sell yourself short. You are important. You are somebody. We're going to make a final stop down in Waco, Texas. I wish we could have gotten there earlier. How I would love to have introduced you to my friend Braz Walker, one of the most remarkable men I think I've ever known. When Braz was 19, he was stricken with bulbar polio. And from that time until his death, just a few years ago, he was flat of his back with a mechanical breathing device. The only part of his body that he could move was literally his tongue. General Motors rigged for him a special device so that he could type with his tongue and so he could take photographs by having the bulb in his mouth and his associate maneuvering him in position. He published several books, did a lot of writing and lecturing, earned at that time thirty to $40,000 a year, despite the fact that all he could move literally was his tongue. In talking with Braz, the last time I saw him, I kind of said to him, Braz, how you doing? Oh, Ziggy said, man, I'm doing good. Now he said, there's no doubt I'd like to be out of here and about like everybody else. But he said, I know that's never going to happen. But he said, you know, Zig, I am just so grateful that I was born at the time I was. 
to the only parents, baby, in this country who would have had the patience to have dealt with me as they have. In the only country on the face of this earth where my life would have been possible and certainly the only one where I could be self-supporting and maintain my dignity as I have. Now he said, I know, Zig, that a lot of people look at me and they figure, well now, if he can do all of those things with the handicaps he has, surely I can do more. You see, Braz Walker never looked down and said, this I don't have. He kept looking up and saying, this I do have. I close with what John F. Kennedy would have said had it not been for that fateful day in Dallas. Here was part of the speech he was going to make. We in this country, in this generation, are by destiny rather than by choice the watchmen of the walls of world freedom. We ask, therefore, that we may be worthy of the power and the responsibility, that we may exercise our strength with wisdom and restraint, that we may achieve in our time and for all times the ancient vision of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That must always be our goal, and the righteousness of our call must always underlie our strength. For as it was written long ago, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. America's a magnificent land, ladies and gentlemen. It's still the land of the free. It's still the home of the brave. It's still the land where any boy or any girl can start from ground zero and using the opportunities that free enterprise offers and using the principles we've been sharing with you, they can start from where they are and accomplish some incredible objectives. We have a tremendous responsibility as adults to make certain that we pass on to the next generation the same opportunity that we have. Let's keep America free and strong. Because if you do, and only if you do, will I be able to say, if you do those things, I'll see you. And yes, I really do mean you at the top. Thank you. And God bless you. Thank you.